<laughs> All right, there we go. Um, just give me a second. I'll put this computer off to the side so it doesn't, you know, bother us. And okay. Ah, all right. Now, uh, so if we get in, I'll try and handle it. If we get any um, any spammers or uh, sure. troll, trolls, etc. Do um, the one setting that you can change is um, that uh, people can't rename themselves. Oh, okay. That's when, yeah, that that's an that's an important one to activate oh, uh, because a lot of trolls once you kick them out will they'll come in with a different name. Okay, so I've I've dis disallowed them from um, renaming themselves. Sounds okay. good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what other security measures could we put in place? Um, should I? Uh, so at the present moment. Uh, the participants aren't allowed to share screens, so that means that they can't. Presumably, we coasts can use the uh, share screen. Mm -hmm. uh, look, normally I start with a just a little uh, a thing, uh, an existentialist um, introductory statement. But um, sure. Okay. Well, so when we get nearer the time, I can just put that up. That in then introduce you. So um, how do you want to be introduced? Just Richard Sassoon from New York? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Richard. I'm just a random person who happened to chance upon this meetup once upon a time. And uh, David reached out to me and uh, asked if I could speak for two hours nonstop. And I said, you know, I have a, I have a glass of water. Let's try it. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave you to make that introduction. I'll just say you're Richard Sassoon from New York. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, well, okay. Uh, so, so your format. Um, uh, I I, act, I actually have a slide with the rules, but basically my format is that I give a presentation, but I prefer interactivity. So, if somebody has a question, um, they can write a comment or they can raise their hand, and I do read the comments while while I'm going through the presentation. So. I'll answer the comments uh, that are made that way. If people wanna raise their hand and interject, I'm more than happy to say, hey, I see your hand is raised. Um, do you wanna say something? Um, and, and sort of do it that way. So as opposed to having a Q&A at the end, I still do leave time for Q&A yeah. at the end, but, um, but instead okay, of doing no. that, I, I try to actually allow people to engage with the material as it's happening. No worries. Uh, you might have some people pushing their, um, their particular, um cause perspectives uh, we've, we've got one chap who will want to insist that the um that the hyksos are uh, aryans okay and what's his evidence for that <laughs> well oh my guess is um uh, you know that they introduced chariots he'll claim sure and but, by, but, I, you know, I, my, my reaction to that is so what i mean i, I, mean, I was gonna I, say a lot of different people had chariots by <laughs> 1700 bce yeah it's, the it's, uh, the, it's no it's it's like saying yeah, yeah. you know F filipinos are clearly indo-europeans why because they use the latin alphabet a lot of people use the latin alphabet it was spread by the yeah, european yeah, conquerors right, yeah. doesn't that say anything about who uses it now anyway he's sort of um uh you know eurocentric uh you know um you know europeans mm -hmm. rule you know just the white supremacy oh when he says oh. aryans he's referring to german aryans or is he referring to like the real Aryans in in, in northern India? No, he, he's he's talking about the, the the you know the 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 you know the, the Nazis and their precursors. So, you know the the uh, not the real Aryans. No. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yes. So okay. So 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 that okay. I, I didn't realize. Of, I, like I would I would figure in the existentialist society you weren't dealing with people who believed in you know completely disprovable mythologies, but uh, but. Look, yeah, no, I can I can talk about that. I, um, it's been wide open to uh, to all viewpoints. Yeah, no, no, no. So, that, ma that makes uh, sense. Uh, I, yeah, I just yeah. so uh, okay. You know, he's got he's got high digger for you know. For, um, <laughs> so so the I mean he doesn't I, use high digger, but I mean he's you know I'm just using I'm saying high digger never renounced being a Nazi. As far as I know. Okay, and I'm I'm a Jew, so if he wants to kill me through the computer screen, you know, have at you. Um, but uh, that, like, I'm I'm even trying to figure out how to refute the argument 
um, because there's no evidence behind the argument, so it's kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, the well, well uh, the you know, uh, from from my reading, historically, the uh, the Mitanni came across, and they were part of these Indo-Iranian Aryans, and they introduced the chariot to the Hittites, uh, and this is um, 16th, 15th century BC. Right, but that's after the Hyksos, because the Hyksos is 17th and 18th century BC. Yeah, so um, there we are, you see. So, so Right. Um, no, no, no. If, if he's talking about the Indo-Aryans, he's talking about the people of Iran and India, then we have a historical argument that we can actually try and color. If we're talking about Aryan as in the Nazi yeah. understanding of history, which is completely at odds with any scholarly analysis that we have today, um, then what's yeah. the argument? That the, the Germans who inherited the chariot Yes. Roughly the time for, uh, that the Romans had it somehow magically transported yeah. back. Like it doesn't, like it just, it doesn't, it, I'm what? trying to find, it's, it's like trying to argue with somebody that believes that Noah's Ark is a historical yeah. event. Well, it's like, well, what, what are you going to say? Like I that see. water pressure under that much water would result in, you know, massive yeah. toroidal yeah. currents. Like, like it doesn't. It, We've it now got um, Richard. Uh, Mark Newbrook was a, uh, a linguist, he's an academic linguist, which is very good. Wow. Uh, now, from my reading, uh, well, not from my reading, I mean, I think it's uh, purely common knowledge that what happened with the, the, uh, the European scholarship, they began to call the Indo-European language speakers Aryans. Some of them were considered Aryans. Yeah, well, like they, the they tended to use that terminology. Uh, but of course, it got dropped after the Second World War, but no, some, no, no, some no, still, no. apparently, there's a few that still continue with calling, uh, when they use the word Aryan, they mean the Indo-European speakers. <laughs> That's awfully wide to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is that the Aryans, when we're talking about that historical group, we're talking about the Indo-European speakers that migrated through what's uh, Transcaucasia and landed in Iran and Northern India. The other Indo-European speakers weren't Aryan. Um, the, probably the biggest contingent among them were Celtic. Right, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so... Um... Hmm. Yeah. Mark, you want to color that a little bit? Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't argue with that. It's, it's, of course, it's a term. There's even an argument about what it originally meant in Sanskrit and the other early Indic languages. But it seems to have vacillated between just meaning Indo-European and meaning Indo-Iranian more specifically. And yeah. then, of course, the, the, as you say, the Nazis hijacked it for their own purposes because yeah. of their often mystical ideas about the ancient world and who, what peoples came from what and so forth. I don't yeah. think anyone, and I think the term's fallen out of favor to a large extent because of the way the Nazis used it. If you try to use it in any other way, people think of the Nazi meaning. Right. And so it's, it's colored the term. It's a term that, that we don't use much these days in linguistics. But, I see. Uh, yeah, but, but I think what you said is entirely accurate about you know, how, how it came to, to that position. And I mean, in India, of course, there's a big mystique about Sanskrit and the origins of Indo-European. And in, in, in my book, I've got a few comments about um, hardline Vedantic notions about Sanskrit being the ancestor language of all humanity, how the Indo-European languages therefore spread from an Indian base rather than a more westerly base. And so now, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, in your mind, does this uh, feel very similar to sun language theory in Turkish or um, or do those two feel very different to you? Um, well, the, there's a similar kind of notion in lots of countries that their language was the ancestor language of humanity. And there are theories about this in Turkey. Um, I've engaged with Polak Kaya. Mm -hmm. who, uh, but, but some of them are even more uh, outlandish. They're not just uh, weird philology. Some of them involve the idea that all other languages were concocted from the language that the person favours. And that's what Polat Kaya said, he argued. And it's something that was pushed a bit by the Turkish government in the 30s, that right. all human languages came from Turkish, partly by way of deliberate corruption. 
And once you have deliberate corruption, all bets are off. Because you're not talking about normal, unregulated language change, which does right. tend to be systematic. You're talking about someone deliberately interfering and changing things and making it more and more obscure. And it's more cryptographic in character than a normal linguistic change. And once you allege that, I mean, Kaya would, would have the idea that the word might be anagrammatized so that it would no longer be recognizable as the Turkish word. Right. And then, what, you know, if you can anagrammatize, you can make it anything you like. And, and there's, a, there's quite a few theories like that. There's, um, there was a guy uh, in America called John White, who was, um, he, he, had a, he invented something called Earth Mother Sacred Language, which was of the same kind. It was an ancestral language, which in this case was one he invented, with very short forms. But there were so many permutations of sound, so you could have it in any order. And any vowel really would do. And the consonants also varied a lot. So in the end, you couldn't prove him wrong on any account because he could always say, ah, well, it changed again like this, often deliberately to disguise this common origin. So this is something that goes on around the world. Hungarian is another main focus of this because of its slightly mysterious origins. Basque is a focus of this because it's clearly not Indo-European, but it's in Western Europe and so on. So it's, it's quite common, but in the case of, in the Indian case, it's often associated, I think, with Vedantic notions. It's got a religious aura to it. It's not just Indian nationalism. And they fight it out about the Indus Valley script, of course. What language was that written in? And we can't read it authoritatively, although I've seen over a hundred claimed decipherments of it. Some as Dravidian, some as Indo-European. And there are people who think it isn't even a language, it isn't even a writing system. It's the very short inscriptions. But for many Hindu believers, it's more than that. It's more than an academic argument. It's more even than a political argument. It's part yeah. of the idea of the, the backdrop to Vedantic. Right, there's a religio nationalistic aspect. The religion, to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it, and so it's much harder to engage in a rational discussion of it. Yeah, I was going to say when you discussed how. Um, in sun and sun language theory, that the Turkish are alleging that uh, there was intentional corruption of the language. This echoes to me a lot of the religious view within Islam, for example, that the Bible and the and the Torah were corrupted by the Christians and Jews respectively, uh, so that they disagreed with the message in the Quran. Right, that 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 originally God had given the Quranic message, and that these uh, Christians and Jews had corrupted their texts in order to distance themselves from it mm. so it has a very similar sort of strain and it's interesting to see that coming up in a nationalistic context this sort of religio uh religious kind of language mm. um especially in the case of turkey where the national mm. nationalist movement was trying to be post-religion uh steven i see you have a hand raised oh yeah i was just gonna ask mark is there any sort of relationship between the indo-european and turkish languages well Turkish is one of the group that's been labeled Turkic because of Turkish being the best known member. And they seem to have, we can trace them back uh, to Central Asia. That's where you get places like Turkmenistan. And the Turks appear to have shifted west. That particular people seem to have shifted west. If they're related to Indo European, it's in very, very deep time because they yeah. do not. For example, yeah, I, I was reading this claim in a theosophical anthroposophical book by a guy called Gunther Verksmith, and he was claiming there was a relationship between the Indo-European, Turkic and American Indian languages, because they I all came from, yeah. uh, they all came from Atlantis. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, I, wouldn't mind oh, okay. a, a I wouldn't mind a reference to that book, Stephen. Okay, sure. Well, I'll dig it out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, if if human language originated only once, and we don't know that, all languages ultimately do have a common ancestor, but it's a very long way back in time. And it's also possible that we devised language separately, different places in different groups. There's, there's an ongoing argument about this monogenesis versus polygenesis of human language. This is so far older than human writing as is known 5,000 years ago that all bets are really off. It, you, you, yeah. It's just like with the deliberate concoction. If the di time depth is great enough, even without deliberate concoction, you can't really work out what might or what not. If someone says to me, what were human languages like 50,000 years ago? 
we in have terms no clue. Of any, and in terms of structure, I, was, I simply couldn't tell you in terms of any, any detail at all. So much can change in that time. If you look, for example, at some, there's, there's, a, there's vocabulary in a language like Armenian, which can be demonstrated, is demonstrably cognate with vocabulary in, say, Latin. But there's been so much change that you can only tell that because of repeated patterns of, of correspondence, not because of any similarity. So you know, the, um, it, it's also possible. Oh, hello. All right. Um, all right, Mark, uh, we, we might want to get started. Yeah, um, that's okay. I mean, yeah, I'm always and, happy and, to and, engage and, in this. Yeah, no, and, and I just want to add as a quick note, um, if any of you speak Turkic languages or know them, uh, you would know that it's what's called an agglutinative language with a lot of suffixes that attach to all the verbs and the nouns. So if you want to say, for example, I don't understand that, it will be biliamiliorum, right? One word of like, I cannot understand that because of all the suffixes that sort of attach mm. to create that meaning. Anyway, uh, David, your uh, existentialist introduction. Well, welcome everybody to the Existentialist Society in Melbourne, Australia. I'm David Miller. I'm the secretary. Uh, today we are having another of our monthly meetup um, lecture discussions on the history of religion. And today's session will be presented by Richard Sassoon from New York. And the topic is... Semitic peoples in ancient Egypt, the Hyksos and the Israelites. And just a word on the format. Um, um, if you wish to um, uh, ask a question or make a comment uh, during Richard's presentation, um, please go ahead. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, in what manner we should... Uh, what would you prefer, Richard? That they put up yeah, the no, raised um, hand I'll, signal yeah. or just just interrupt? Yeah, ra ra raising the hand is perfect. If you don't prefer to raise your hand, you prefer to put a comment in the comment section. I do read the comments, so um, if you prefer to do that, that's fine too. Um, and yeah, so I think I can uh, take it from here. Great, go ahead. Okay. So yeah, here we are, the Hyksos and the Israelites. Um, all right, so uh, here are the rules, right? So uh, this is not an academic presentation. I am not accredited in history, religion, philosophy, or any of the topics that we're studying today. I'm a lawyer by trade, um, and this is just a hobby of mine. I hope uh, that uh, it's as enjoyable for you as it is for me. Um, and this will be a secular presentation. So I'm obviously going to touch on some religious topics, especially when it comes to the Israelites, but I'm gonna try and do that from a secular non-religious perspective. Um, and uh, I want to sort of point out, uh, let's be respectful of the topic. Um, there's of course, Will Wheaton's famous law, don't be a dick, right? Um, I love interactivity though. So please ask your questions, comments, clarifications. As I said, I read the chat. Um, if you prefer to raise your hand and talk, um, that works too. I'll call on you when I see your hand raised. Um, and so during the presentation, you will have the ability to interact. Um, I like to say that when I do these kind of presentations, it'll be a 101 and a 201, meaning that if you don't know anything, I'm gonna catch you up. And if you already know something, I am uh, more than happy to take you to the next level and teach you something that you didn't know. Um, I say that there's going to be a two hour hard stop, which basically means that at the end of two hours, um, at four o'clock Australian, Eastern Australian time, um, when, uh, wherever we are, that'll be where we stop. We might continue some uh, conversations, but I won't bring up more slides. And finally, this is being recorded. Um, when I have it uploaded, that should be in a day, two days. Uh, I'll send David an email, and uh, he and we're gonna and we'll post the link to the YouTube video um, in the comments for this meetup. All right. So I want to start with the Israelites because uh, most people are more familiar with them, so it'll be a lot easier to go through uh, the story of what happened. So. Um, to sort of put us 
in sort of the headspace of what happened according to the biblical narrative, uh, you had uh, the Israelite patriarch Abraham and his great grandsons um, had a number of intranacine squabbles, one of them being Joseph and Joseph uh, was brought to Egypt. Eventually Joseph brought uh, the rest of his siblings and their families to Egypt and um, Moses, after 430 years of slavery, according to the biblical narrative, uh, Moses brought these people out of Egypt. Um, they took a route uh, into uh, Canaan, modern Israel. And uh, he, though, however, did not lead the invading armies. His uh, first and uh, the, his first commander, uh, Joshua, led the armies uh, from what was in the what was sorry, what we now call the country of Jordan, because they made sort of a semicircle. Uh, so they were crossing from, uh, from the Jordanian side. Uh, they conquered the land and then they established the Israelite kingdom. So now the dates on this are different between different religious groups, depending on whether or not they wish to adhere to the 430 years of slavery. There's a lot of contention uh, in religious circles as to whether this 430 is an exact number, right? You see this much more from biblical liter literalists, or this 430 is a metaphoric number. A lot of numbers in the Bible, like 40, like seven, um, like 17, have certain numerical significance. Um, and so a lot of the numbers that we see are multiples of these numbers and are therefore more thematic than they are uh, explicative of an exact moment of time. The second piece is to what event are you trying to peg uh, your timeline, right? In this case, this timeline that I, that I pulled down was one that was trying to peg everything to um, the founding of uh, the Davidic kingdom. And so in order for the Davidic kingdom to have been founded at the right time uh, with 400 years of judges, which this site was taking literally, you needed to push this back to 1447 BCE. Now, there, are, uh, there is no consensus among those who take the Bible literally um, about uh, what exactly uh, was the time that Moses would have left. The earliest estimates would put it around 1500 BC. The latest estimates would put it at around 1300 BC. Um, the most common number I'm familiar with is around 1290 BC. Um, but of course, as I said, there's flexibility depending on whether you take these 400, uh, these 400 years of judges after Joshua's invasion and this 430 years of slavery in Egypt as exact numbers or figurative numbers and how you're trying to expand or collapse this timeline. Now, for those of you, uh, uh, so I want to sort of show um, our understanding of these time periods. So my intuition is that when I grew up religious, I'm, I'm no longer religious, but when I grew up religious, then Moses um, led the Israelites out of Egypt in 1290 BC. So this is what the Middle East would have looked like at that time. You can see the new uh, kingdom of Egypt. This is the 19th dynasty. Um, and that dynasty controls all of the Levant region up to the current border of Lebanon and Syria. Um, right on the Syrian side, you have the Amuru, which is a Hatti state. And uh, south of that, along the coast, you have the Egyptian held territories in the Levant. Um, this, was, um, this was to the degree that there were any states in the Levant. These states were either tributaries or vassals of the Egyptians, if not direct conquered territories. Um, and in terms of the Judaic states that we know existed historically, we have the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. This map is dated to 880 BCE and corresponds with our archaeological understanding of the two kingdom period, right? But uh, Israel was the more prosperous kingdom. It had a coastline um, and the religion of Israel from an archaeological perspective um, was a uh, polytheistic religion based on typical Canaanite uh, precepts. It had the Canaanite pantheon headed by the god Baal. Um, the Bible also records this. Of course, the Bible makes the argument that they knew what the proper religion was, which would, of course, been uh, monolatrous Yahweh worship and the relegation of these other gods to uh, either non-existence or being false gods. 
but that the people of Israel venerated Baal, Asherah, and several other Canaanite gods. Um, Judah um, was monolatrous in its faith towards Yahweh, who was the war god in the Canaanite uh, pantheon, and Yahweh eventually became the dominant uh, god of the Jewish people, a Jew being a citizen of Judah. But um, you had a lot of uh, polytheism as well as monolatry, uh, especially if we're going to go back as far as 880 BCE, uh, before the Jewish religion uh, was stabilized to a certain degree by the collation of the Bible, uh, which would happen in subsequent centuries. So when it comes to modern archaeology concerning the Exodus story, um, the general consensus seems to follow a little uh, about what Israel Finkelstein uh, has said. And so I'm going to read it and sort of give a little bit of commentary on what he said here. The conclusion that the Exodus did not happen at the time and in the manner described in the Bible seems irrefutable when we examine the evidence at specific sites where the children of Israel were said to have camped for extended periods of time during their wandering at the desert, like Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 33, and where some archaeological indication, if present, would almost certainly be found. Yet repeated excavations and surveys throughout the entire area have not provided even the slightest evidence. So if we try to follow, uh, if we try to follow the way that the Israelites would have left Egypt, right, they would have started, okay, they would have started around here somewhere in the eastern part of the Nile. They would have uh, crossed some sort of body of water around here, whether it's uh, this uh, part of the Gulf of Suez or uh, a smaller lake, right? Because it's identified in the Bible as the Sea of Reeds. And once they cross there, they start wandering around and they go in all kinds of different places. And then they finally end up on the Jordanian side and come over this way. Right. So that's the path of the Israelites through the desert. And there are places like Kadesh Barnea, where the Israelites, according to the Bible, camped for years. And when you have a large group of people traveling through the desert, there's naturally going to be a certain amount of detritus that they leave behind. And in Israel Finkelstein's book from 2002, he goes through a number of these places um, and he points out how these sites either did not exist during the time in question, or they have nothing to indicate a large scale migration when ever went through there. So you would expect uh, that you would see something uh, if that were indeed the case, right? You would expect to see some kind of dilapidated evidence. And obviously it wouldn't be as complete as the, as the houses on this windswept beach, but you would see uh, something, uh, something that would point to that kind of presence. Now, one of the things that he brings up is uh, that the Exodus seems to refer much more, the Exodus story in the Bible, sorry, seems to refer much more to the situation um, that we see. Okay. Yeah, refers much more to the situation that we see Israel dealing with in its own time, right? We've mentioned that the two Judaic kingdoms that we know archeologically are from roughly the ninth century BCE. And the kind of Egypt that they describe in many cases reflects more what we would have seen in the ninth century BCE than we would have seen in the uh, previous centuries, right? Either the 13th, 14th, 15th century BCE, whenever this Exodus is postulated to have occurred in that time period. So I'm going to read a little bit and then give some commentary, right? The historical vagueness of the Exodus story includes the fact that there is no mention by name of any specific New Kingdom monarch, while later biblical materials do mention pharaohs by the names, for example, Shishak and Necho. The identification of Ramesses II as the pharaoh of the Exodus came as the result of early modern, scholarship, early modern scholarly assumptions based on the identification of the place named Pi Ramses with Ramses in Exodus 111 and 1237. The Bible may reflect New Kingdom reality, but it might as, just as well reflect later conditions in the Iron Age, close to the time when the Exodus narrative was put in writing. So one of the things that we notice if we look at the later books in the Bible, um, if we're using the Christian uh, organization, we're talking about the histories books, 
If we're using the Jewish organization, we're talking about the books of prophets. Um, and in these books, um, two pharaohs are referred to by name um, in terms of their interactions with the kingdom of Judah or the kingdom of Israel. And those are um, Shishak, which has been identified with Pharaoh Shoshank. Um, you can see in the lower left-hand side, this is a, this is a sphinx of the Pharaoh Shoshank. Uh, the first, it's actually on, on exhibition in Brooklyn. Um, and this is a known Pharaoh from, uh, I believe it's the 19th dynasty. Um, so this, this is a known quantity and his interactions, as I said, are named. In the same way, when uh, we have wars between Babylon and Egypt, Pharaoh Necho is mentioned by name um, in the Old Testament scripture. And this would incline us to believe, right, that if the story of the Exodus was being written about a person who actually existed, right, that Pharaoh would also be named. But in the entire Exodus narrative, there is no mention of the name of the Pharaoh that's involved. Now, we do see as, as Israel Finkelstein points out, the association that we have with the Pharaoh of the Exodus story being Ramesses II is because of the connection uh, of the city Pai Ramses with Ramses and the assumption that the only person who would have built a city under this name would have been Ramses. But we know also from later Egyptology that Egyptian rulers built cities and named them after previous cities in a way to capture former glory. So this could actually be one of the cities that was being seen in ninth century Egypt by uh, people either from the kingdom of Israel or kingdom of Judah. And therefore they were ascribing uh, that construction to this earlier mythical period. So in terms of Egyptian references to Israel, there really is only one. Um, and um, this is the Minerpeta Stele, also known as the Israel Stele, because of its mention of Israel. There's a funny story about when the Stele was on earth that uh, the archaeologists who translated Israel were so excited because they knew that their grant money uh, would be substantially improved and that they would finally be on the map because anytime anything remotely seems to correlate with biblical history, um, uh, money and fame seem to pour right in. So you can see the line, the one line on this entire stela uh, that refers to Israel, where it says, Yisrael fakat bin part fit, right? Uh, that Israel is laid waste and his seed referring to his grain stores, nothing, nothing, x-rated uh, his grain stores is not um and given the context that it's uh mentioned ne next to ashkelon gezer and yanoam which are think, all cities sorry, along the coast sorry i don't think it's grain stores i think it's the uh, um since it's mentioned along with ashkelon gezer and yanoam um these are cities along the coast of uh israel and so to add Israel along with these other groups uh, makes complete sense. Um, so, but notice that this is, this only this is the only reference to, to Israel and it's referring to Israel as an established entity in the um, coastal regions of the Levant, right? It's not referring to them as a population in Egypt. Um, no indication uh, is given that they have any connection to Egypt. Um, by contrast, um, a lot of the rest of the stele is about Chenu. Chehenu is the Egyptian term for the people of Libya at the time. And the earlier parts of the stele refer to uh, Chehenu's interaction with uh, the Egyptian state, with, with Kemet, um, which is the Egyptian name for Egypt, and um, how they were able to overpower them. So, uh, just to give a brief overview of the biblical story, if if you don't know it or uh, or you want a little bit more clarity on it, um, in the biblical story, you have uh, Joseph and his uh, th eleven brothers, who, as I said, are great grandchildren of the patriarch Abraham. Um, Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt, and after being sold into slavery in Egypt, rises through the ranks of the Egyptian government, uh, 
because of his gift of dream prophecy. And he's able to uh, foresee a famine, which results in his brothers who are in Canaan and also suffering from the famine to come down to Egypt to partake of the grain that Joseph has managed to store during the prior years of plenty. Um, the brothers eventually are, uh, are convinced that they should move to Egypt by Joseph. And uh, the family uh, moves to Egypt in an area called Goshen, which has never been properly identified with any specific region in Egypt, but appears based on the narrative to be close to the river Delta in Northern Egypt. Then a new Pharaoh also not named, right? Both Pharaohs, the Pharaoh that Joseph knew and the new Pharaoh are not named as we pointed out before. This new Pharaoh uh, sees fit to enslave the Hebrews and they are enslaved, as I said, for 430 years, according to the narrative. Um, at that point, Pharaoh issues an edict that all um, male uh, Israelites should be killed because he has a prophecy that one of them will overthrow him. Of course, the one uh, Hebrew male that is not killed uh, is recovered by a princess of Egypt and she raises him um, until he later flees um, to the camp of Midian and sees a burning bush. The burning bush, of course, being a divine revelation that inspires him to go back to Egypt and save his people. This person, of course, being Moses, uh, with the name Moses being I drew, uh, meaning I drew him from the water. And then Moses um, launches a massive slave revolt, uh, assisted by God, inflicting the Egyptians with 10 uh, plagues. After these 10 plagues, the, Jew, uh, the Israelite people um, arrive at the Sea of Reeds uh, using God's power. They're able to cross this Sea of Reeds and end up in the Sinai Peninsula. The Egyptians are unable to follow uh, as the sea closes back upon them. And then um, after 40 years of wandering, Joshua, um, Moses's second in command, uh, begins to amass forces on the Jordanian side of the Jordan River and uh, to consider a siege against the city of Jericho. Interestingly, the Bible, starting with the book of Joshua and in the later history books, tends to dwell much more on the military tactics involved, uh, regardless of whether these battles actually occurred or not. Um, and so we have references, for example, to Joseph sending in spies who, um, who take residence with the town prostitute. Uh, you can see her on the upper right-hand side, allowing that spy to escape over the wall uh, and give news to Joshua. Um, and we also hear about Joshua's destruction of many uh, cities within Canaan. We, uh, of the cities, there are 31 cities that listed that Joshua destroyed. Of these, very few people um, very few of them have been destroyed in the proper time period or were destroyed at all. Um, Phil, I notice you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, it, well, first of all, the dates are very confusing. I'm not going to ask about the dates. But, uh, but are, are you sort of saying, which I suppose the Bible uh, hints at, that all Jewish people, all Israelis, all Israelites, all descendants of Abraham, it's not that like there was a bunch of people around and Abraham was among them and there was descendants and they were dominant, but, but, but they're not all uh, uh, offsprings of Abraham. Are, are, you saying, are you saying that? It's, uh, the terminology is, uh, is, is sort of the issue with the question. So, so let me sort of back up a little bit. When I say Israelite, I'm referring mm -hmm. to the ancient people. Israelis are the modern citizens of the nation okay. of Israel. Right. So in order to get from Israelites to Israelis, there are a few intermediate steps. Right. You have the Israelites moving into the land. Then they divide into those two kingdoms. Right. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah that I showed on that map. The kingdom of Israel is destroyed by Assyria and its people are assimilated away. So the king of Judah remains the only self-identifying group of Israelites that survive because they're from Judah. They're called Judeans. And the term Judean in English dropped the D for linguistic reasons. And so that became Jew. Okay, but, the, but, 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 but by my original question, it's just simply, are all Israelites, are they yes. all descendants of Abraham? You yes, know, according to okay. the Bible, yes. Okay, all right. 
Um, I also have a comment that Moses sent in spies, not Joshua. Uh, this is incorrect. Moses did send in spies. Joshua also sent in spies. And the two spies were, uh, were different. You can see the ones that uh, Moses sent in in the book of Numbers. Uh, those are 12 spies, one representing each tribe, uh, to assess the land and determine whether it was, uh, whether it was accessible and conquerable. Uh, the report of 10 of those 12 spies meant that they would not invade the land because the people were convinced that it was too dangerous. One of the two spies who said that, that the conditions were favorable was actually Joshua himself. The story of Rahab the prostitute and, uh, and Joshua's spies in the land occurs in the book of Joshua, I believe chapter three, but it might be one or, one or two chapters in the other direction. Um, but that is a different spy, different errand. And of course, uh, I have a comment saying Abraham isn't necessarily a historical figure. I believe he is not a historical figure, right? This is the Jewish Christian legend, right? This is the, this is the mythology. Um, and as I said, the, the archaeological evidence points to this event not happening, that none of this event happened. Mm -hmm. um, and by contrast... Um, sorry, if I said Joseph, I, Joseph was the one who went uh, to Egypt first. Joshua was the, was the first spy and also uh, the leading commander um, to bring the Jews into Israel. But um, yeah, so you have this invasion uh, described in the Bible and there's really no archeological evidence for it. Um, as I said, with regards to Joshua's sacking of 31 cities, of them only eight appear to have been destroyed in the relevant time period uh, for the story to work. All the other ones either didn't, were not built yet, survived through the period, mm. um, or had already been destroyed long before the period. So it, so it seems like a reconstruction of a past that did not exist in order to differentiate the Israelite people from the other Canaanite peoples with whom they shared a history, culture, and religion. Now, from the archaeological perspective, the differentiation between the Israelites and the Canaanites simply came as the Israelites moved further away from the coast and into what are called the Judean highlands, which is the hill country in the eastern part of what is now Israel and the West Bank of the Palestinian territories. So though uh, the people that were living there began to eat differently than the people on the coast. And we know this because of what are called middens. A midden is sort of a food trash pile um, that ancient homes would have because there wasn't a sanitation network, right? You would just throw the dead food in the back. And we noticed that the middens on the coastal regions have pork bones, whereas the middens in the highland region do not have them, right? So this seems to be the first clear delineation between the Israelite community and the coastal Canaanite communities. But as I said, they were still worshiping the same pantheon uh, of gods and the number of gods and the way that they worship those gods would change over subsequent centuries. But um, there seems to be no historical evidence that any of the events that I've just spent about 20 minutes explaining to you uh, actually occurred. All right. So now let's uh, talk about the Hyksos, which is probably why you're here, because they're, they're, they're the different thing that people are not as familiar with. This is actually a painting from Beni Hassan, um, which is a gravesite um, that has, sorry, it's from the gravesite of Khnumhotep, which is a 12th dynasty uh, pharaoh, but it shows the Hyksos and it shows the way in which they were perceived by Egyptians, uh, primarily being herds people. Now, so I want to sort of give a timeline and an understanding uh, that's a little bit uh, clearer on Egyptian history. So when we talk about Egyptian history, we have um, what are called golden ages and intermediate periods. Um, I have a comment that says, actually we have evidence that there was no invasion, but a rebellion. 
Um, if you're referring to the Israelites rebelling against the Canaanites, there are certainly wars that we have between the two different peoples, and we have evidence for a lot of wars. I don't know if it was a rebellion per se, because that would, in, that would imply that the Canaanites, who were not Israelites, um, controlled that country uh, effectively. We do certainly have uh, fights by Canaanites and Israelites against attacking powers. All right. Uh, but when we go to Egypt, we have the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom. Uh, and these periods you can see indicated by the yellow on this timeline, these are periods of immense power in Egypt. Uh, they indicate that the government was centralized, that they were able to exact taxes over the entirety of their domain, that they were able to build fortresses at the edges of their domain, and uh, secure the unity of Egypt. Now, one of the important things to realize about Egypt is how dependent Egypt is on the Nile River Valley. The area outside of the Nile is completely inhospitable, save for a few oases, oases that you can see. Like, for example, if you look at the left side map, you can see Wadi Natron. Um, that area is a oasis. And so you had some population there. Um, but otherwise, this area um, was very constricted to the Nile. And so what a pharaoh needed to do was ma maintain effective control over the Nile River. And the Delta was one of the hardest areas to maintain control of, given how snake-like uh, snake the rivers were, how many small pieces of land there were, and the requirement to maintain a river navy, which Egypt, of course, did. Now, one of the other things you may notice on this uh, timeline is that there are blue periods, uh, which are called the intermediate periods. And the intermediate periods signal that the Egyptian dynasty that was in power or to the extent that there was an Egyptian dynasty in power, could not control all of the Nile River. Uh, certainly not the river north of Kush, which is located in what's now uh, southern Egypt, northern Sudan, uh, uh, also called Nubia. So you can see um, at the beginning of the second intermediate period, we have uh, the 13th and 14th dynasties. And towards the end, we have the 15th dynasty, which is the Hyksos, of the 16th dynasty, which was a vassal possibly of theirs, and Nubia expanding uh, further north. Uh, I have a comment that said maybe that the rebellion that we're talking about is against the aristocracy that had been propped up by Egypt or against the Canaanite elite under Egyptian rule, though those are those are definitely things that occurred. There was definitely fighting against um, governments that were in, uh, imposed by Egypt. But that's uh, but to be clear, that's very different from uh, you know uh, an invasion and conquest of territory. All right, so just to give some sort of uh, sense of what was going on in the Middle East, right? We had that map from 1300. Um, now we're in a much earlier period. We're in the middle 1700s, and at this point, the dominant power in the Middle East is Babylon, and Babylon um, exists along the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers and had conquered some of the older Assyrian and Subartu civilizations, Assyria and Babylon would both go through periods of expansion and contraction. This was one of Assyrian contraction. Assyria would later become dominant. Um, and of course, the Assyria that we all know and fear is the Neo-Assyrian Empire, uh, which would happen at around 600 BCE, so uh, about a thousand years after this. This is actually the period in Babylon of King Hammurabi, who managed to unite all of the territory. And of course, Hammurabi is incredibly famous for his law code. At the same time, we have two kingdoms in what is now Syria. Um, we have uh, Yamhad in the north and Katma in the south. And uh, you can see this is the seal of King Abael. Uh, he was the king of Yamhad, uh, roughly at, uh, just after King Hammurabi uh, died. And you can see several things that I, that I want to point out here in the seal. The first is that the symbology that he uses on the left-hand side in terms of the imagery is very different than what you would find in Egypt and mirrors much more what you would find in Babylon. There is one exception, though. Um, in the center, you can see the priest holding up an ankh, which is an Egyptian symbol of life. Uh, it looks like sort of almost like a Pillsbury Doughboy. Um, and the Ankh would represent the fact that uh, Yamhad had trade with Egypt and was uh, probably familiar with this symbol. Uh, 
you can also see that cuneiform is used on the right hand side, right? Um, this cuneiform was the style of writing that was originally created in Mesopotamia and had spread uh, to other parts of the Middle East. But you can see that the way that it's written is in top-down vertical form. Typically, when we find cuneiform coming out of Mesopotamia, we find it horizontal. But the Egyptian style of writing was top-down. And so this may also have been an Egyptian influence on the way of writing uh, in Yamhat. So in order to set up the Hyksos, I need to sort of explain a little bit of what happened before. So let's go to the 12th dynasty, which is the last dynasty of the Middle Kingdom, right? The Middle Kingdom being that period of Egyptian power before the second intermediate period begins. And so we know that they had a capital of Amenemhat uh, can uh, We don't know the exact location of it, but we know that it was uh, in the part of the Nile that was below the delta, but was what well, sorry, but what was a little bit expanded because you can see just to the west of each uh, Amenhat Ichtawi um, is a large uh, area of water uh, that is a tributary of the Nile that sort of dies in the desert. But because of that, there's a lot of water. And so that area is a lot wider in terms of the amount of cultivation that can occur. Senesert the first um, was one of the dominant pharaohs of the 12th dynasty. And he is famous for building a number of fortresses along the edges of Egypt. And when I say edges, I'm referring to two different areas, right? We're talking about the area of the river as far south as Egypt managed to control in order to prevent invasion from the south, from the Nubians, from the Kushites, and uh, fortresses along the eastern side of uh, the Nile Delta to prevent invasions from um, Canaan and from the Levant region. Now, one of the things that uh, is missing, of course, is these Egyptian pharaohs would not build uh, fortresses on the western side because at this point, Chehenu or Libya was not strong enough to pose any obstacle. Remember, the Minerpita Stele was from 1207 uh, BCE in terms of when it was dated. So, the, so that's 500 years, actually 700 years after Senesret the first. So, um, and that, uh, so very different geopolitical situation. Now, in terms of what these fortresses look like, this is a drawing of San Magharb. And um, this is one of the 13 forts that delimited the Southern border of Egypt, the Northern border of Nubia. Now, by the end of the 12th dynasty, the Egyptians had basically run out of men in this dynasty, which is why Sobekenefru uh, became uh, pharaoh in 1785 BC. Sobekenefru was the last um, ruler from the 12th dynasty, and she is actually the first woman to have ruled in her own right. Uh, she precedes Hatshepsut um, and Nefertiti as well. Um, in terms of her ability to stabilize the empire, towards the end of her reign, she had suffered an immense famine and so was unable to continue holding authority. And it's why her successor is considered the beginning of the 13th dynasty. Typically, these dynasty cutoffs are, mar are marked by a massive change in the organizational structure of Egypt, not necessarily a change in actual bloodline. So, just to sort of explain the end of the Middle Kingdom and the beginning of the intermediate period, right? We have the end of Dynasty 12 leadership. We have no clear line of succession, uh, of succession and the viziers uh, are the ones who are trying to keep Egypt together. But of course, this leads to fighting between the nomarchs who are the rulers of the different nome or governance of Egypt in this period. And that collapse prompted by the famine leads to a split between dynasties in North and South Egypt. Now, this map, uh, this uh, section delineates how those were divided um, because you have Avaris, which is in the Nile Delta, the northernmost point of Egypt. Then we have what's called Northern Egypt, which is south of the Delta, but north of Thebes and follows the main arc of the river just before it splits into the Delta. 
And if you go further south, further upriver, you have Thebes, right? And so you have different Egyptian dynasties controlling different areas along this river system. And it's an important thing to clarify that the number of the dynasty doesn't mean that they are successive. Dynasty 13 and Dynasty 14 existed at the same time. Dynasty 13 and Dynasty 15 existed at the same time. Dynasty 16 and uh, 16 was followed by 17, but 16 and 17 existed alongside Dynasty 15. So these numbers simply record that it is a different dynastic group uh, that is in operation, not necessarily sequence. And so you can see that in Northern Egypt, Dynasty 13 is followed by Dynasty 16, and in Thebes, Dynasty 13 is followed by Dynasty 17. There will be a quiz later, so you know, keep, keep the line straight. Um, okay, so when we get to Dynasties 13 and 14, we have a very interesting situation. And now Dynasty 14 on this on the map on the left of the right-hand side is identified as Hois, right? X-O-I-S, because Hois was one of the areas that may have been their capital city. You can see that at the northwestern fringe of the Nile Delta. Now, the people of Hois, we don't know to what extent their rulers were Semites or to what extent their rulers were Egyptians. Uh, we have reason to think that there were Semites at least somewhat mixed in their ruling class. And there had been a number of Semitic migrations into uh, the Nile Delta. We'll sort of discuss where those came from in a bit. Um, but one of the things to point out is that we have several scarabs, and these scarab seals are the indication of ownership that would be presented with a trade good, similar to a signet ring imprint. And, um, the, and all of these uh, uh, scarab seals would contain different names. In this case, the name imprinted here is Jakob Har. Jakob Har is clearly of a Semitic root, linguistically, and not of an Egyptian root, linguistically. So it is quite possible that this 14th dynasty ruler was himself a Semitic speaker, if not a Semitic person. Uh, hi, Phil, I see your, your hand. Yeah, do, doing this split dynasties, uh, w w were they hostile to each other, or were they just like kind of mutually compatible and not astray and relatively friendly, like United States and Canada, as an example. Sure, uh, I think I think United States and Canada would definitely be pushing it. Um, okay. But but um, I would say like Greece and Turkey is the right way to think about it, right? There there is a high amount of trade between Greece and Turkey. They have formal relations, but there's a lot of bitterness between them too because of the shared history, right? And I think that that's accurate here. The problem, and we're going to get into this a little bit, is that a lot of the sources we have about the Hyksos are incredibly biased against them uh, because of how they were written and how they survived. So um, we don't know. With regards to the 14th dynasty, there doesn't seem to have been as much animosity as there was against the Hyksos, who are the 15th dynasty, right? And um, we also see, sort of to, it goes to your question, but it was something that I was going to bring up before. If you look on the left-hand side, you see Ursarkare Khanjar. Um, and Ursarkare Khanjar was one of the rulers of the 13th dynasty, right? He's controlling that green area on the map on the left-hand side. Now, Ursarkare, is an Egyptian name. Um, it, it, it means um, protector of Ra, right? That's what that Ray means at the end. But Khanjar is an Arabic, sorry, uh, sorry, is a Semitic uh, root. Um, the root Khazara um, exists in numerous Semitic languages and refers to pig, right? So Usukare Khanjar now has this bifurcated name where he has an Egyptian name and a Semitic name. Possibly this uh, explains relationships between the 13th and 14th dynasties in terms of trade or other kinds of communication because Usukare was certainly of Egyptian heritage. Now, um, if we look uh, at the lower picture, right, I kept this because Egyptians depicted themselves as a starving people at this point. And the 13th dynasty was plagued with a lot of instability owing to the fact that the pharaoh could not provide for the people. Now, this is a very important 
thing to grasp because in Egyptian society, the Pharaoh was divine. The Pharaoh was a god. So his inability to provide for the Egyptian people showed that as a god, he wasn't powerful and, and that he couldn't uh, achieve what was necessary for the Egyptian people. And you can see uh, that this uh, issue uh, led to both Chois, the 14th dynasty, and the Nubians to the south pushing uh, and uh, into uh, Egyptian territory and making the Egyptian state weaker. So now who were these Hyksos? And we have a line from Maneto. We haven't sort of explained who Maneto is, but um, we will in a bit. Now he is one of the best sources we have in terms of who the Hyksos were. And he writes six kings of shepherds, ca they captured Memphis, and founded a city in the Nome, right, the governorate of Seth, which is in the northeastern part of the Nile Delta. From there, they set out to conquer the Egyptians. So a couple things I want to point out here first, right? The first is this concept linking the Hyksos to shepherds, right? That this was an occupation that the Egyptians saw as something that delineated them as being separate from uh, others. And when we get to the conflation between the Hyksos and the Israelites, uh, which I addressed sort of at the end of the presentation, um, you're going to see that this understanding of the Hyksos as shepherds is something that uh, connects these two cultures. Now, in terms of written sources, we have a lot of written sources, but most of them are not that great. Um, and the reason they're not that great is that none of them are written by the Hyksos. One of the common things we see in Egyptian historiography is that when one dynasty takes power in Egypt, it erases, defaces, and destroys all of the monuments of a previous dynasty that cannot be co-opted into their own narrative. So the Hyksos, of course, were an enemy from outside of Egypt uh, who took over Egypt, they could not be brought into this narrative of the Pharaoh being all powerful, of the Pharaoh being able to control Egypt. They were, uh, but of course they weren't forgettable. They ruled the country for a hundred years. So they were turned into something closer to a demon, something closer to a boogeyman. And to try and extract history from the Egyptian sources that we have on what the Hyksos did would be like trying to understand Romanian history by reading Dracula, right? It's, it's a portrait that has something at a very high level to do with uh, the Hyksos society, but at a very granular level tells us very little about what's actually going on in the country. Um, the best source we have is Maneto and his book, uh, Egypticus. Unfortunately, that book no longer survives. Um, we only have it in excerpts relayed by other people, most famously Josephus, um, who was using these uh, passages to argue that the Hyksos and the Israelites were one and the same. And we'll go through some of these passages uh, towards the end of the presentation. So, um, we also, uh, yeah, so I think I sort of covered everything. The other piece is that we have the Turin list or the Turin canon, and it's called the Turin canon because it is currently in the Turin Museum of Egyptology, um, not because it was discovered in Turin, um, but uh, this is a list of kings. And these king lists are literally like an Excel sheet, right? It will say uh, 12th dynasty, this king, this king, this king, this king, this king. It gives us no historical story about these people. It has no, uh, is nothing that we can sink our teeth into and say, these are the achievements of this Pharaoh. This is the thing that he did. So even to the extent that we would want uh, a propagandistic version of history, we don't even have that from the Turin, uh, the Turin canon, but it's useful to compare that canon to Manetto's historiography, because then we can see the parallels and overlaps. Now, we have a number of Semitic migrations, and you can sort of see this is the map from, uh, from the period in the uh, 18th century uh, BCE. Um, and you can see that in the Levant region, there really are no uh, societies south of Yamhad, right? We talked about how 
sorry, it's around 1700 BCE. Um, Yamhan had conquered Katna by this point, and so Katna had disappeared from the map. And in Canaan, in Lebanon, in uh, in some of Syria, those areas um, are a number of tribal peoples, and these peoples came to Egypt for a variety of reasons. Some of them came as captives because the Middle Kingdom had launched a number of raids, um, uh, like Senesut the First, for example, in uh, in the in the twentieth century uh, BCE, um, but also later than him had launched raids into Canaan, and so some of these people were captives who had been taken in those raids. Another uh, group of immigrants. Uh, were miners and builders. These were people who were brought in because they were guest workers. And they, like most guest workers, even in our present day, uh, stay in the countries where they originally were only supposed to sojourn for a short while. They find partners, they settle down. Some of them were genuine immigrants looking either for a better business opportunity or looking for a, be uh, a better government that was more stable than what was existing in the Levant region. Some of them were moving because of climate. There were massive climate changes across the Middle East uh, during this time period. And so Egypt being on a fertile river valley uh, probably seemed like a good place to set down roots. Some of them were there to uh, facilitate uh, diplomatic alliances through marriage. And so uh, those would create trade links between the Levant region and Egypt. Whatever the reason is, we know that the migration of Semites was substantial. We're talking about maybe 30% or more of people in the Nile Delta were Semites as opposed to indigenous Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to naming these people, the Egyptians really did not care um, to be specific with the variety of people that they encountered. And so they used the term Amu, which again, if you speak a Semitic language, you know the word Amu in Semitic basically means people, right? So um, all of these Asiatics, that's what the scholars in the West call them, um, were called Amu. So we don't know, um, for example, were more of them coming from what's now Lebanon? Were more of them coming from what's now Israel? Were more of them coming from what's now the Palestinian territories or Jordan? We don't know. Uh, we don't know their affiliations. We don't know their distinct religions. We don't know their occupations. The Egyptians classified them all as a unity. Um, and so when we get to the name Hyksos, we also have to realize that this name Hyksos is not what they would have called themselves. This is a Greek translation of an Egyptian term to refer to these people. And the Egyptians called them the Hekachasot, which of course the Greeks said, bless you. Um, uh, and so the word Hyksos was invented to get something close to the sound of Hekachasot um, uh, that the Greeks could understand. And we see this word referring to the dynasty of rulers. But the Egyptians don't make clear how these Hyksos are related to these earlier migrations. It could be the case that we had repetitive waves of migration and the last wave of migrants were these Hyksos. It could be the case that there were multiple waves of migration and all of the uh, Semitic peoples together came together as one unified rebellion of many different peoples against the Egyptians. It could be the case that the Semitic people, similar to the 14th dynasty, which clearly had some Semitic relationship, um, were part of the bureaucratic structure of the 14th dynasty, and therefore just simply assumed power when the 14th dynasty ran out of rulers, right? And so they sort of just took the mantle for themselves. It's not entirely clear who these Hyksos were relative to these Semitic migrations. We only know that they were people who had come from these Semites. And when I say Palestinian territories, I'm referring to Gaza and the West Bank. Um, you can label them as you wish. So when um, I say um, come in peace, right, we sort of uh, have a number of different texts that describe them. And we've gone over several of these uh, and the ones that we haven't gone over, uh, we will uh, in due course. Uh, the only one that I really hadn't uh, planned to go over was the tomb of the soldier Ahmose. Um, because his account basically parallels uh, the Pharaoh Ahmose, the two different people, same name. Um, 
and I was going to discuss the Farah Moza and his campaign. Now, you can see uh, Queen Hatshepsut, who lived hundreds of years after the events of the Hyksos, um, uh, writing in her, in her tomb, I have restored what was destroyed. I have raised up what had been shattered since the Asiatics, right, the Amu, referring, of course, to the Hyksos in this case were in the Delta at Avaris, when the nomads among them were overturning what had been made, they ruled without the god Ra. Sorry, they ruled without the god Ra. And this is critical, right? Because a lot of the Egyptian pharaohs, they connected their divinity to the god Ra. And so, um, and so most Egyptian pharaohs, especially in the older dynasties, will end their title with Ra. They did, and did not act by divine decree right down to my majesty's time, and then, of course, Sir Isaac Newton decides to opine on a people that he never met, basically saying that they were human cannibals and that the Egyptians were somehow vegetarian, which, of course, both of these things are false. So, right, we talked about how uh, it could have been uh, an internal uprising, it could have been a reestablishment of a state, and it could have been a violent conquest. We really don't know, um, but the violent conquest theory, which Manetto uh, promotes, and I'll sort of talk about that when I get to him uh, more, more in depth, um, we don't see large-scale destruction uh, that we would expect to see um, if there was some sort of massive uh, takeover. Now, one of the things that I wanted to show um, and it sort of goes to how Egyptian uh, historiography works, is that you can see this, these feet and this statue was from the 12th dynasty. But the Hyksos king, uh, the Hyksos king right, from the 15th dynasty, Khian, actually wrote his own cartouche. You can see in the lower left-hand side, that sort of thing that looks like it's a lima bean with uh, characters inside of it. That is what's called the cartouche, and it's the name of a pharaoh will be uh, placed inside of that circle. And you can see Pharaoh Khian um, has his cartouche um, on this monument that he did not build, right? So he's trying to appropriate it as his own. I have a question about why, when did the police team invade Israel? Um, because you might be putting the cart in front of the horse. When I was using the terms Lebanon, Israel, Palestinian territories, and Jordan, I was using them as modern terms to refer to the piece of land. I was not referring to the ancient societies that may or may not have inhabited them at a certain period of time. As for when the Palestinians or the sea, sorry, when the Philistines or the sea people um, arrived uh, in the Levant region, um, that's roughly around 1200 BCE. So uh, long after this period. Gaza as a city existed long before the um, long before the Philistines got there. Uh, Phil, I have a hand raised. Yeah, uh, I guess the question is, we generally think of the history of Egypt as being relatively steady. I mean, there was different dynasties, but relatively steady. But what you explain is that in a sense, there was not only a lot of like reappropriation by different dynasties racing the past. So that might have attributed to the kind of steadiness because you just erased that. But it almost seems like the way you're telling the story is that there was a lot of turbulence within Egypt as well as within the rest of the Middle East. Uh, before before the Bronze Age collapsed, because this all happened, according to your thing, before the Bronze Age collapsed. So the Bronze Age collapse was the pinnacle to this turbulence, but it was started way be before that because there was a lot of people migrating and you know exchanging and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, so it was, it was never really all that steady, even in Egypt, let alone the rest of, uh, you know, Babylon or the Levant, you know. Sure, the, sure. There are there are two things that I would um, point out here. The first one is that yes, this happened before the Bronze Age collapse, but there were movements of people all around in in the world long before the Bronze Age collapse. Uh, mm -hmm. People people weren't forced to stay in a certain place. And when people talk about the staticity, if we can call it that, of the 
pharaonic Egyptian state, we're talking generally about the kingdom periods, right? The early kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the late kingdom periods. And those periods tended to be relatively stable where you had strong pharaohs who could control both upper and lower Egypt. That's not the case um, with regards to uh, the intermediate periods where the Egyptian pharaohs were much weaker. And there are a variety of reasons why that may have been possible. In this case, it was possible because the, the famine weakened the power of the 12th dynasty and the different nomarchs began to take power for themselves. And the Semites who were involved in governance seemed to appropriate more power to themselves to, to enter the power vacuum. In terms of reappropriation, we see this throughout Egyptian history. Um, Egyptians are very loath to tell a history that disagrees with their own notions of what happened. Um, so one of the most common jokes that Egyptologists will make is that Egyptians never lose a war according to their own documentation. They keep winning and sometimes they win wars in the wrong direction. So when it comes to reading the cartouche, right? Um, one of the things that is interesting, because right, we have the scarabs, right? This, these symbols of their identity and power. These scarabs have um, a title, a marker on the top. And that marker on the top is a symbol of the fact that they are foreign. Um, the, the staff, of course, representing shepherds, right? Um, and so we have all of these symbols within the scarab that can be read sort of like an alphabet. And the term heka chasut, right, of course, that the Egyptians were using doesn't mean anything in particular other than the fact that they are foreign rulers. In, uh, that was the ancient Egyptian term. And so uh, other translations of hyksos that try to equate them with being shepherds are not uh, commensurate with the information we have. Um, one of the interesting things uh, that uh, has been done recently are strontium analysis. And strontium um, is an element that occurs naturally in humans, especially in our teeth. Uh, it's very rare in terms of its percentage, but strontium um, occurs in a number of different isotopes and forms. And those are heavily influenced by the environment that a person uh, grew up in and lived in. So we can tell uh, a number of things uh, from the strontium analysis. We can see, for example, that over 50% of the people who died in Hyksos territory that we have discovered were born outside of Egypt. They were born in, uh, in we suspect, the Levant, but we don't have enough evidence to confirm right from other Levantines that that's the case. We also know that they're not from the same place in the Levant, which sort of confirms what we were thinking about numerous different migrations from different parts of the Levant. And that they didn't come at exactly the same time. The bodies themselves are different ages in terms of when they died. Very few of them um, died by violence. And the, largest, the larger percentage of the dead are women as opposed to men, which is not what we would expect in a military uh, takeover, right? We would expect a lot of male casualties, um, but it but it seems that um, the community had a large number of women, which would indicate migration as, and settlement as opposed to uh, military conquest. So we have several. Uh, uh, conclusions that we can reach, right? We don't know if there was military action. We don't know if they were invading force or whether they uh, took power from the inside. Um, they have some kind of connection to the Levant. And we're going to talk about how they assimilated to Egyptian culture to the extent that they did. Uh, but despite that, they still maintain their cultural roots. And we'll sort of discuss that. Um, and they were not slaves, They, uh, right? To the extent that we know anything about them, these Hyksos were free people um, who became part of the administration either through war or through peace. So this is the war narrative. Um, Manetto um, provides this narrative where he says the Hyksos 
who are the 15th dynasty, seized Egypt without striking a blow, and having overpowered the rulers of the land, they burned our cities ruthlessly, raised to the ground the temples of the gods. Now, there are several things that I want to pull from here. The first one is that we seem to have a contradiction in terms, because they overpowered the rulers of the land without striking a blow, which seems kind of surprising. You would expect that if they overpowered them, they had to hurt them in some way. Um, the only way to square the circle here is that the, if the Egyptians were so impressed with the Hyksos military capability, that they just surrendered without a fight, which would be very surprising. And of course, in uh, Manetto's conception, you would have temples like the one on the right-hand side that were built in the Middle Kingdom being destroyed uh, by the Hyksos. There may well have been uh, a number of temple destructions, um, but uh, especially since the Hyksos had a different style of temple architecture and a different uh, set of gods that they worshipped. But it was nothing close to the fire and bombs and, and hailstones uh, that Mineto seems to imply and that this image from the mummy movie would uh, realize. So to the extent that these technologies show up in Egypt. They show up in Egypt only during the second intermediate period. And so while we don't know for certain that it was the Hyksos who brought them, it's not an unlikely assumption to say that they did. And these are three basic technologies that really define Egyptian warfare in the New Kingdom. So the first one is the composite bow. The composite bow uh, as you can see in comparison to this traditional bow, has an arc in it and is made of several different materials and resins that, uh, that do two things at the same time. They amplify the strength uh, that the cord uh, that, in, into which the arrow will be placed has. So you don't have to pull the arrow back as far to get as, the same amount of power on your shot. The second piece is that um, it lessens the height that you need for the same amount of power. So the composite bow is shorter in height and stronger in power than the traditional bow of the same, uh, yeah, uh, of similar caliber. And it means that you can be further out of range than your opponent who is using a traditional bow would be, which is a great military tactic to shoot where your enemy can't hit you. Another uh, important development was the chariot. Um, the Egyptians, as much as we think of them using the chariot, didn't use the chariot until the 18th dynasty um, in any 17th and 18th dynasty in any seriousness. And the Egypt and the Egyptian chariot um, was modeled after the Hyksos chariot, and it had room for two per, uh, for two people. You can see uh, the one on the right hand side is holding the reins of the horses to direct them. And there is another uh, person who would hold the Kopesh sword. You can see the Kopesh sword in the lower right-hand side, which was great for hacking. Most Egyptians that they would fight against either used lances or um, short daggers, which are useful for stabbing, but not for hacking. And so if you're moving quickly, um, having a, a sword like the Kopesh sword is an incredible tool in order to take down your adversaries. All of these gave the Hyksos a distinct advantage over the Egyptians. Now, a common question that's often asked is, um, why were the Hyksos and other people attaching this cart to the horse as opposed to just riding the horse? And there are two reasons for that. The first one is that the saddle, which is an incredibly complex piece of technology, had not yet been invented yet. So the, uh, along with the stirrups, which is how you'd motivate the horse to move. Without those key inventions, there was very little way to control the horse when you were on top of it. And the second one is that horses of significant size had not been bred yet. So these horses could not carry the weight of a person on their back, even, even if they had the proper saddle and equipment. Those horses of a larger size would be bred later. So one of the interesting things is that Manetto shows that the Hyksos were engaged in the traditional method of e e uh, Egyptian statecraft, which was to build fortresses at the edge of the territories. The fortresses that had been built by Senesret I had fallen under foreign control by the end of the 12th dynasty, especially when, by the time we got to the 13th dynasty. But the Hyksos were rebuilding these forts. And he says in relevant part, 
Finally, they made one of their number named Seletus, the king. He resided at Memphis, exacted tribute from Upper and Lower Egypt, and left garrisons in the places most suited for defense. In particular, he secured his eastern flank, as he foresaw that the Assyrians, as their power increased in the future, would covet and attack this realm. Now, the first thing to point out here is, of course, the Hyksos were not concerned with the Assyrians. The dominant power in Mesopotamia at this time were the Babylonians, as we pointed out. So Maneto is misremembering this period. And we also have to realize Maneto, when he wrote his Aegypticus, was writing in the third century BC. He was writing roughly in the time that Greece, uh, under Alexander of Macedon, uh, had conquered Egypt. To give a perspective of how time removed he was from the events he's describing, it would be like if I wrote an eyewitness account of Charlemagne's crowning. Um, so this is, a, this is his memory going through the sources, um, his memory going through the sources and understanding what it was that he was seeing. But what's critical, of course, as I said, is that he was building these fortresses to defend on the eastern flank from Canaan, from the Middle East, which is what we would expect of a person uh, who was in charge of at least Lower Egypt, right? Lower Egypt is the Nile Delta, the furthest north area of Egypt. It's confusing because the Nile is a river that flows northward. Um, but another piece is that he exacted tribute from Upper and Lower Egypt, which means that he not only had relations with the 16th dynasty and the 17th dynasties in the southern part in Upper Egypt, but that he was demanding tribute from them, meaning that he was more powerful than they were. Uh, Phil, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I want to ask a question of the fortress you're showing on, on, on the photograph right now. Is no, that, it's not. Is, what? That, it's not from what, this time period. Oh, okay, okay. Speak because I was I was wondering about the arch because okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I just put it there because it's pretty to look at as opposed to just having the the text there. Um, okay. And this is a and this is a fortress in roughly the same area that those fortresses would have been in, okay. which would have been on the Sinai side of the Suez, of what's now the Suez Canal, right? Okay. It would be on the Sinai Peninsula, but still uh, very close to the Egyptian Delta. Um, and if we look at the Turin Kings list, um, this is the list that we have. So, right, these are the kings that are referred to in the Turin Kings list. Um, and the ones about which we know the most we know about Seletus from Maneto, but very few other sources. Um, king Chayan and King Apophis were the two most famous pharaohs. And we have numerous of their seals, not just in uh, Lower Egypt, where they were ruling, but in places as far away as Babylon, um, Nubia, because they were clearly conducting trade with those other people. So now if we look at the city of Avaris, that, that capital city of the Hyksos, um, we see a number of interesting things going on. The first one is if you look at the buildings and the general layout of the city as it's reconstructed on the left-hand side, you can see that the city has very square buildings. This is very typical of Egyptian construction in this time period. However, if we look at the right-hand side and we see a reconstruction of the central palace in Avaris, we see an interior courtyard, right? And inside that interior courtyard is a pool. And there's also another interior courtyard on the far-hand side um, with a portico uh, surrounded by columns. This interior courtyard structure is much more common in the Semitic Levant. And so we can see some hybridization of the architectural styles of Egypt in terms of building a larger city, but the, that the Hyksos themselves built in a typical Semitic style. We also have recovered from um, Tel el Daba, which is the name of the archaeological area where Avaris is, um, a reconstructed wall that bears some artwork that is Minoan style, um, mm -hmm. indicating that there were trade relations with Minoa, which is, of course, the dominant civilization on Crete during this time period. And although it is what is in now modern Greece, it is not in any way connected with, for example, the civilization of Homer and, um, and Aristotle. 
right? Those that's a completely different uh, civilization. The Minoan civilization uh, collapsed in the Bronze Age collapse. Hmm. Now, in terms of what's going on at Tel Aviv, um, we have a number of different sites and we sort of organize them into how they would look. Now you can see on this map, this area of white, uh, the white is actually the Nile River. And so you can, uh, specifically the easternmost of its tributaries. And so you can see the city was built alongside these tributaries, which meant that it was an effective guard post entering into the Nile River from the Mediterranean and vice versa. It made it also very strategic in terms of uh, making it much more difficult to capture because there are only small points of entry that could be guarded by land and you would need an amphibious force to take it. Now, the name of Aris that we use is the Greek name for it. Again, this was a Greek translation of the Egyptian by people like Maneto, um, because the Greeks who conquered Egypt were not interested in learning how to speak Egyptian properly. Um, they wanted everything in a language that they could understand. The actual name of the city was Khutwaret. And so, as I pointed out, right, the city had a number of Egyptian and Asiatic characteristics. Um, in terms of uh, the burial objects, a lot of these tended to be Egyptian. Um, in terms of the religion, uh, the religion was somewhat hybridized. The armor, uh, one of the unique things that Semites did was that they buried um, people with their armor. Egyptians didn't do that, right? Remember, Egyptians mummify their dead. Um, or, uh, yeah, uh, or, they, or they bury them in a sheet. They don't, they don't put uh, clothes on them. But the but Semitic people did, and as I pointed out, the home layouts with porticos in the center is a very um, uh, Semitic uh, type of construction style. We also see the pottery, and I'll show you a picture a little bit later um, that we've recovered in Tel Aviv um, has a number of Semitic influences as opposed to Egyptian ones. Now, one of the key differences in terms of governance between Egyptians and Semites was that Egyptians, as I said, believed that their ruler was a god. Semites did not believe this. Semites believed that their rulers were inspired by God, received prophecy, were connected to the divine, but were not themselves divine, that they were still human. And so it's unclear from the records that we have whether or not the Hyksos took on the divine mantle of pharaohhood or retained the Semitic style of being uh, empowered by the gods. Regardless, everything below the pharaoh on the Egyptian pyramid, be it government officials, soldiers, scribes, merchants, and on the way down, they lifted from the Egyptian system. And to the extent that they had a bureaucracy, it was a very Egyptian style bureaucracy. They didn't bring um, large numbers of scribes, for example, from the Levant to teach people how to write cuneiform. They weren't um, bring governmental ministers from Babylonia. Um, they were effectively using Egyptian styles of hierarchy. And to point this out a little bit further, the writing style that they're using is hieroglyphics, even to the extent that it is a Semitic language. So um, I wanted to sort of delve a little bit into the linguistics here. Um, the Egyptian and Semitic languages are both Afroasiatic languages. That means that they have a common ancestor in the same way that English and Russian have a common Indo-European ancestor. But that doesn't mean that, for example, a speaker of English can understand Russian and vice versa, right? It just means that, that a long time ago, there, uh, there was an ancestral language, and we can determine this because of morphological structures in those languages. How do they use their verbs? How do they use their nouns? What is the relationship of those things in a sentence? Do they have similar word origins in, in certain cases? And so Egypt, the Egyptian language and the Semitic languages are two different branches on this Afroasiatic tree. So they're not related to each other in a way beyond this sort of historical ancestral relationship that, again, you could characterize between English and Russian. So in terms of the languages that would have been spoken by uh, the Semitic people living in Egypt, right? We have a number of different strains that are possible. And um, 
probably the most dominant ones are those you can see um, uh, classified as Amorite, which would be in the right time period, as well as Proto-Canaanite, right? That's, that's the right time period for the, these Semitic languages. Now, as we pointed out, when we saw the, she, when we saw the seal from Yamhad, the way that the people wrote in the Levant was to use cuneiform. And one of the interesting things about the way that they used cuneiform is that originally cuneiform was similar to the way the Chinese language is currently constructed in that you use ideographs to represent a certain idea, right? It's the same way that we use numbers, right? If I write the number two, there's nothing about it that indicates that it's pronounced with a T sound at the beginning. Right? We know that because we recognize the symbol and we pronounce it as two, and it has the concept of two. In the same way, the cuneiform was originally this sort of ideographic system that would represent a concept with a certain set of strokes. However, by this point, what had happened is that it had decayed into a syllabary. So it, for those of you who are familiar with linguistics, this is very similar to the Japanese uh, hiragana and katakana systems, where, for example, ma would be a letter, mo would be a letter, meh would be a letter. Every, uh, it would be a vowel, sorry, a consonant vowel combination would be one symbol. And this is how um, the hieroglyphs, sorry, this is how cuneiform was used at this point. Um, so you could write languages other than uh, the original Akkadian language, which was the one that was being represented, and you could use it strictly as those sounds to create new language, write new languages that were not necessarily Akkadian. So what you would have expected for these Semitic languages is that they would be using this kind of system. And the seal of Yamhad that I showed you was using that kind of system, where those uh, ideographs were being used for their pronunciation and not for their meaning. Now, what is interesting is that the Hyksos applied this, or at least the Semites uh, in, um, in Egypt applied this to hieroglyphs. And so they took the sound of the hieroglyphs and applied it to their own language. And you can see here, this is what's called uh, Sinaitic um, hieroglyphs, right? These are hieroglyphs from the Sinai. And these hieroglyphs from the Sinai are actually representing Semitic language with Egyptian symbols using that same structure of applying to them this syllabary structure. Mm. I have a question. When you said that the Hyksos were not slaves, did you mean that they did not have a social hierarchy? They didn't have slaves. They, did they enslave other ethnicities? The, when I said that the Hyksos were not slaves, what I meant was the overwhelming majority of the people that are Hyksos had no period of enslavement. Right? When we talk about the Israelite story, a key aspect of the Israelite story is that they were slaves in Egypt and that they had some kind of slave rebellion, slave revolt uh, initiated by Moses, and they were able to escape Egypt. That's a key part of the Israelite story in the Bible. The Hyksos, as far as we can tell from both the Egyptian side and uh, what remains of the archaeological preservation, indicate that they were not slaves right, that that was not a part of their narrative. Did they enslave other people? Certainly. Uh, Egypt under the Hyksos had slaves, just like every other Egyptian dynasty did. Um, and those slaves were bought and traded, just like everything else, and they were probably captives of war. Um, yeah, uh, Phil, I see your hand. Yeah, what you mentioned about, about what the Hyksos did with, the, uh, with mixing the hieroglyphs and the sound seems like that was a very important moment because we generally think of the Phoenicians as inventing the first alphabet in which the Greek took. And this is sort of, this is prior to that. In other words, yes. like it was prior to that, which allowed it to become a, even more abstracted and then finally into alphabet. Absolutely. So, so, no, syllabaries were an intermediate step towards alphabets because so, the so idea that, so that the relationship alphabet. between the Hyksos and the Egyptians was a very important transition of uh, uh, well, fusing the, those two together and then and then allowing it then to develop in the alphabet. Yeah, um, one of the interesting things is that uh, later on the Egyptians developed what's called hieratic, which is 
the same sort of thing where they have adapted their hieroglyphs to effectively become an alphabet. Yeah, yeah. Or celebrity. I have a question. Are you saying that the Hyksos were the people the Bible referred to as Hebrew slaves? The point, uh, what well, I'm not saying that they are. In fact, I say that they are not. Um, I don't think that these are the same people. However, there is a lot of historical conjecture um, that tries to link these two people or conflate them. And I'm going to actually discuss that later in the presentation, but that that is definitely something that is said because when uh, people who believe that the Bible is an accurate retelling to a certain degree of the historical uh, exploits of the Israelites, they point to uh, the story of the Hyksos as being a Semitic people who entered Egypt, who were expelled from Egypt, and therefore um, fit the general uh, general nature of the Israelite narrative. Um, I have a comment from Mark. There's a script type between a celebrity and alphabet called Abu Gida, and the best example is the Ethiopic script. I agree. Um, uh, Devanagri is also another uh, good Abu Gida. Um, and that also is part of the trajectory from syllabary, right, which is more mentally intuitive, because when you pronounce a letter, you almost always pronounce a vowel with it. You can't just say, mm, right, like people don't think of M that way. They think of M, right, the E eh and the M sound together. And so putting those sounds together and writing M as opposed to M um, was more mentally intuitive. Eventually, the vowel became subordinated, which is why where the abugidas come from, where the consonant is larger and the vowel is attached to it. And then eventually, you have alphabets where either the vowel is not represented, like Hebrew and Arabic today have non-represented vowels, or and those are called abjads, or you have languages like English where the vowels and consonants have equal representation. All right. So... When we talk about um, I have a comment that yes, Ethiopic remained in Abu Gida while uh, Nagari became more alphabetic from an Abu Gida start. That's absolutely correct. Um, okay, so we also have Semitic religious beliefs creeping in um, to the way that the Hyksos are um, governing and ruling from a religious perspective. So you can see here, this is what's called a cylinder seal. And the way it works is that you would have a piece of clay that is imprinted such that when you roll it over a piece of papyrus, it will drop ink in a repetitive uh, circle. And you can see this is one uh, cylinder seal. And you can see in the middle of it, you can see that there's a man standing on two mountains with a staff in his hand. That is Baal Sifon. Sifon is the Semitic word for north. Um, so that was Baal, king of the north. And of course, we mentioned how Baal is one of the deities of the Canaanite pantheon. He is not in the Egyptian pantheon at all. Um, and he was considered the god of the north, right? Ra, of course, is the god of the south, because Ra being the sun god, the sun is always in the south of Egypt, right? So in order to establish themselves as the northern dynasty, they, they identified themselves with Baal. And so... Some have argued that the war between the Hyksos being the 15th dynasty and the 17th dynasty of Egypt, which is the first dynasty to really engage the Hyksos in open war after 100 years, um, was a war of beliefs that the, the southern god Amun-Ra, uh, which represented the upper Egypt, the southern part, was fighting against the Hyksos in the north, who were represented by this foreign god baal Sifon, or by the Egyptian god Seth. And the Hyksos create an equivalence between the god Baal and the Egyptian, and their god Baal from the, from the Levant and Seth from Egypt. Now, one of the interesting things is that as we trans, as we move from the Middle Kingdom to the New Kingdom, is that references to uh, Seth change in Egyptian history, right? The Egyptian gods are not static. They actually change under different rulers and under different under different times. During the Middle Kingdom, Seth was the evil one. He had murdered uh, Osiris, who was king of the gods. And so when we look at sources from the Middle Kingdom, we see Seth uh, being connected to the concept of weather, the concept of powerful activity, 
the, con the idea of pustules mm. on the skin, right? And being evil inferior. The size of these circles is indicative of the number of sources we have that refer to them in these kinds of ways. If we were to look at the New Kingdom, number one, the references to Seth increase monumentally and um, evil and inferior goes away and so do the pustules, but voice and uproariousness replace them. In the Hyksos view, Seth was a god of chaos, a god who, um, a god of rage and storms, which makes sense because Baal was a god of rage and storms as well. And so this Baal identity had been interposed with the Seth identity in the Egyptian context by the Hyksos. And so you see in the New Kingdom a presence that Seth has because the cult of Seth is probably the strongest surviving piece of Hyksos um, ideology in Egypt after their expulsion, um, that Seth is represented positively in a number of Egyptian uh, New Kingdom uh, art, uh, art and architecture. You can see, for example, this is from the temple of Abu Simbel, built by Ramesses II. And you can see on the left, uh, you have uh, Seth um, helping Horus, who is typically represented as the uh, god that intercedes on behalf of pharaohs, right? Horus was always in pharaonic iconography, but Seth is now part of pharaonic iconography, and they are both crowning Ramesses. Um, and of course, Horus is also connected to the sun. Um, and so it's also a symbol of uniting Upper and Lower Egypt, right? Upper Egypt being represented by Horus, Lower Egypt being represented by Seth. Um, and so this god has a rehabilitation in the Egyptian consciousness because of what the Hyksos have done. Another god that the, um, that the Hyksos worship is Anat. Um, and Anat exists in both Egyptian and in Canaanite mythology. Um, and so we actually don't know, strictly speaking, what the origin of Anat is, whether she's one or the other. But you can see as the Hyksos were threading both lines, this seems like a great god that can bring people together um, in a way that uh, Baal or Seth being localized uh, cannot. One of the interesting things that we see here um, is we have four sp uh, sphinxes um, that were discovered uh, by the Mariettes. Uh, that was an archaeological family. Um, and this is actually from their notebook of having discovered uh, these sphinxes. Now, these sphinxes were originally built in Dynasty 12 by Amenemhat II, and, but, uh, uh, and sorry, four of them were built by Amenemhat II, and two of them were built uh, in the 13th Dynasty by Asmenkhaira. But uh, these were taken by uh, King Apapi, King Apophis, of the 15th dynasty of the Hyksos, and he inscribed his cartouche on them, right? He, he claimed them for himself. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side, the Mariettes actually working out the cartouches, right? Because you can see, if you look closely, that at, on the head, uh, just below, sorry, just below the neck of each of these sphinxes is a cartouche, working out from the cartouches that this, uh, that uh, Apepi had taken um, ownership of these sphinxes and claimed that they were his. Uh, Phil, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I want to mention about Seth. I mean, because that, because uh, Seth was uh, an evil one, but he was tolerated because it was necessary uh, in the old kingdom. Right. Uh, and, and the and the fact that the Hyksos appropriated him in terms of an idea that's deeply embedded in the culture and transform it into at least somewhat of a positive God, mm -hmm. uh, was a deeper appropriation than just merely chiseling the past dynasty out <laughs> or like carving your, your seal <laughs> yeah, on an old statue because it really is embedded into the whole myth of Egypt itself, which, was, which is interesting. I wonder to what degree that the Hyksos did that kind of appropriation uh, successfully, because because that was a very very successful appropriation. Um, I I don't think the Hyksos were any more successful in appropriating uh, Egyptian symbols and iconography than any other Egyptian dynasty. The Hyksos are not unique uh, for carving um, their uh, cartouches onto other people's 
um, constructions, especially when you get to uh, pharaohs that are trying to assert their power and are very uh, and are somewhat weaker, right? The Hyksos don't control all of Egypt, um, so they're trying to project their power. And one of the easiest yeah, ways yeah, to project but, their but, power. But, but what I'm saying is with Seth, it was a different kind of appropriation about right, ideas right. that leads to the mythology that's deeply embedded into the psychology of the people. Yeah, and so yeah. that kind of appropriation to me uh, outlasts it, their own ruler, rulership. Absolutely. No, it was, it was a key part of the new kingdom. All right. So, uh, and we talked about the scarabs. You can see here, these are several scarabs. Um, you can see King Sheshi, um, King Khayan, and um, some of these, for example, um, come from burials uh, as far away as the Levant as well, right? So uh, these scarabs uh, are symbols of uh, uh, trade and power that these pharaohs had elsewhere. And as I mentioned before, uh, the pottery that we've recovered from Tel Alihudia, which is uh, on a Western uh, prong of the Delta, um, is very Canaanite in style. Um, in particular, if you see in the bands, you have these dotted punctuations that look sort of like uh, leaves on a tree almost. Um, those are a particular style that developed in the Levant, was not used in Egypt at all, uh, other than by uh, the Hyksos and other Semitic peoples, um, and require stenciling and a number of different firing techniques. So to sort of get our bearings before we talk about the expulsion, um, I wanted to sort of put a map so we sort of see where the Hyksos are towards the end of their reign, towards the reign of King Apepi, for example. The, the direct rule of the Hyksos that we can confirm is in the area that is orange. Once we get to the areas that are pink and yellow, we're looking at areas where the Hyksos exacted tribute or likely exacted tribute. It may well be the case that that tribute extended even further south. And there are debates among Egyptologists as to whether the 16th dynasty um, of Egypt was itself a vassal or tributary state of the Hyksos or um, was independent to a certain degree. Um, and it's hotly debated because of course, if that were the case, that the Hyksos completely dominated the 16th dynasty, then Egypt would have a broken historical record, right? Many Egyptologists want to claim that Egypt is a society that has an unbroken historical record from the unification under King Narmer um, all the way until the Persian conquest at around 500 BC. Hmm. And this would cut that squarely in half. Um, so, but by the time that we get to King Apepi at the end of the Hyksos reign, um, we are no longer in the 16th dynasty in the south, we are at the 17th dynasty in the south. And the 17th dynasty you can see is concentrated around uh, Thebes, and that's in that light green area, and it extends in terms of its vassal states and uh, areas of military operation further north along the Nile in the dark green area. The map on the right hand side is the spread of the chariot. And you can see that the chariot is believed to have first been discovered roughly at around 2000 BC in the heartland of uh, what is now Kazakhstan. And it's spread out from there um, through, uh, through Central Asia, through Europe, um, and arriving in Egypt, roughly coterminous uh, with the Hyksos presence in the country. Hmm. So we start seeing uh, Egyptians moving to strike against the Hyksos during the reign of uh, the last uh, 17th dynasty pharaohs. This is Second Enre Tao, and um, he is noted for having a number of objections uh, to uh, Hyksos continued rule, the most famous of which he attests that the noise of the hippopotamus baths in Avaris is keeping him awake in Thebes. Of course, that's not possible from a sound perspective, but it is a way of communicating his displeasure with not controlling the entire north of the country. We also know that he went to battle. Um, if you look at his mummy, uh, you can see above his eye socket, there is a gigantic gaping hole, which is 
uh, the correct shape and size for a Canaanite axe head, which would have been a typical weapon used by a Semitic, a Semitic person. And so it's believed that Sekhen and Reitao uh, got into a fight with the Canaanites and they crushed his head open. One of the many battles that I'm sure he won. Huh. So when it comes to the battle against the Hyksos, one of the best sources that we have is the Carnivon tablet uh, by King Kamo, Pharaoh Kamos of the, 12, of the 17th dynasty. And I have a comment, the Aryan hordes used the chariots to terrorize the known world. Um, they and many others, uh, nomadic people um, were, uh, until the formation of drill in the 15th century, right? Uh, which is where you have guns in formation. Um, cavalry uh, was the most effective way to terrorize anybody. So uh, it wasn't just the Aryans, most people in Central Europe uh, used this technology. In China, of course, you have the Xiongnu uh, who did the same kind of thing. In, uh, in Europe, you had the Huns. In India, you had the Alchon Huns. In Persia, you had the Hephthalites. You had a number of different people who engaged in this kind of behavior. But back to the Carnarvon tablet. So again, when we get to Egyptian sources, we have to be incredibly, um, uh, we have to analyze and be incredibly um, distrusting of the source material because the Egyptians are writing propaganda. They're not writing an accurate retelling of history. They're not trying to uh, get an accurate retelling of history. But we do see a number of interesting things in this tablet, which is why I wanted to read it and sort of go over it. I should like to know what serves the strength of mine when a chieftain in Avaris and another in Kush and I sit united with an Asiatic and a Nubian, each in possession of his slice of Egypt, and I cannot pass by him as far as Memphis. No man can settle down when despoiled by the taxes of the Asiatics. I will grapple with him that I may rip open his belly. My wish is to save Egypt and to smite the Asiatic. So there are a number of important things to point out here. The first one is that the Pharaoh admits his own inadequacy here. I cannot pass but him as far as Memphis, meaning that the, that the northernmost areas of the Nile Delta and that the area, uh, even where they meet and a little bit further south than that, which because Memphis is on the part of the river that is singular as opposed to the Delta, is inaccessible to him, that those areas are controlled by a rival king and, and successfully so. That's the first part. The second one is he explains the geopolitical situation rather clearly, that there are three kings in what is traditionally Egypt. There is the king in Avaris, by which he refers to the Hyksos ruler. There is the king of Kush, who has expanded his power into what is traditionally Egyptian territory. And there is Kamose, the Kamos himself. Another piece that we should take uh, is that despoiled by the taxes of the Asiatics, which implies that he is a vassal or tributary state of the Hyksos, that he is paying inordin inordinate amounts of money to maintain either his independence or maintain his trade. Um, and finally, uh, he has declared war on the Hyksos, right? My wish is to save Egypt and to smite the Asiatic. And in this tablet, we also see him documenting uh, his raid on Nefrusi. And there are several things that come out of this raid that are worth noting in terms of understanding Egyptian battle tactics against the Hyksos. The first was that they used the Medje. The Medje ha have appeared in both the Second Intermediate Period and in the New Kingdom. These are mercenaries from Nubia who were paid to be part of the Egyptian military as an elite strike force. And you can see a representation of them in the upper left-hand side. He also mentions that he has foragers, um, which I've sort of used modern foragers in the lower right-hand side uh, to represent. The uh, forager is a military division that goes into the neighboring area, finds food that is available and provides them to the troops. One of the advantages of this is that it means that your supply lines have to carry less food to the front line uh, in order to keep these people active. And finally, he mentions that he has a chariot charge at first dawn, which shows that he has integrated chariots into his style of warfare, and he attacks at Nefrusi. Of course, Kamos uh, uh, says that he won this war, just like he won every other battle, uh, but uh, 
despite his victory, it doesn't seem that he has actually achieved much, which would lead us to believe that he did not actually win the war. We also have another piece of the Carnivan tablet that I want to uh, read a little bit further. And this is Kamos's uh, coup de grace. He says, I captured the Hyksos messenger in the Oasis upland as he was going south to Kush with a written dispatch, and I found it on the following in writing by the hand of the ruler of Avaris. Ausuera, son of Ra, Apophis greets my son, the ruler of Kush. Why have you arisen as a ruler without letting me know? Do you see what Egypt has done to me? The ruler which is in her midst, Kamos the Mighty, given life, is pushing me off my land. I have not attacked him in any way comparable to all that he has done to you. He has chopped up the two lands to their grief, my land and yours, and he has backed them up. Sorry, and he has hacked them up. So a couple things to draw from this. The first one is that there was at least a long-standing communication and alliance between the Hyksos and Kush uh, in the north and south of Egypt. The second one is that this relationship is long established, right? Why have you arisen as a ruler without letting me know? Meaning that the succession of kings in the different kingdoms would have been alerted uh, one to the other because of this strong relationship between the parties. And finally, um, that this is an interception of a spy's message. So we have um, Kamos um, un, uh, trying to break up this alliance uh, between uh, the Hyksos and Kush. Of course, he paints it from the perspective that Avaris is weak, right, to bolster his own strength, um, but it's very clear that this alliance uh, was in operation during this period. Phil, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually going to ask a question that's a little funny because I'm actually more interested in this tablet in the writing than what sure. is written. I mean, like the writing does not look like either hieroglyphics or cuneic form. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a script. I would have yeah, thought it was on paper, but I, I presume it's on clay. So is that is this like a, just a script style of hieroglyphics, or is this completely a different style altogether uh, that's more like a flowing style that how do you read? I mean, how the Egyptians read sure. it? Is it a different different thing that they read, or is it just a translation of hieroglyphics? No, this this is hieratic, right? As I mentioned when I talked about the Hyksos using the hieroglyphs as a syllabary. Uh -huh, this okay. evolved into the Egyptians copying this mechanism okay. and being able okay. to write, create a script that would write as a syllabary the way that they spoke. Okay, okay. So that's what this is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we then see that there are naval attacks on the city of Avaris led by the Egyptians, right? You can see these are new king, uh, this, these are warships from the new kingdom, but the ones in the second intermediate period wouldn't have been that different. And so I've sort of zoomed in, right? This is the map of Avaris uh, based on the excavations at Tel Adabat. And you can see the palace located in the center between these uh, different strands of the Nile Delta. Now, it means that you need to have an amphibious force in order to attack. And Kamos um, was one of the people who masterminded an amphibious assault on Avaris. The fact that Avaris was still standing uh, after this very successful victory uh, shows that it was probably not a victory. We also see that in the Kamos Stele, uh, Kamos discusses that he uses flanking maneuvers in order to get around the uh, defenses placed by uh, placed by the uh, Hyksos in order to defend their capital. Uh, Phil. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't put down my hand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And finally, um, Kamos is succeeded by Ahmose the first. And Ahmose is usually seen as the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty the first dynasty of the new kingdom that has unified Upper and Lower Egypt. Ahmose, you can see from this, uh, car, uh, from this uh, uh, hieroglyphic uh, imprint, 
uh, is also leading an amphibious assault. You can see that they are coming from his chariot over the water. And he manages to conquer uh, Avaris and expel uh, the Hyksos. But expelling them from the Nile Delta is not sufficient. And so um, after, he has has, after he has done this amphibious assault, he marches his chariots through the entirety of the Sinai Peninsula and arrives at Sharuhan, um, which is located in modern day Israel. You can see the map on the mm. lower right hand side. I'm sorry, lower left-hand side. And Ahmose records that he besieged Sharuhan for three years before finally evicting the Hyksos completely from the Egyptian sphere. Ahmose I and subsequent pharaohs expanded their power into the Levant, as we saw from that picture at the very beginning of this slideshow, right, where I talked about what Israel looked like um, in, the in, the in the 13th century BCE, right, when we were talking about Moses. And so Egypt at this point would begin to set up colonies in the Levant. And there are sort of two reasons for this. Uh, the first one is that I believe the Egyptians were incredibly scared of the possibility of an attack coming from the East. Now that one had, now that Semites had managed to take power, whether they had done it through military means or through usurpation, and they did not want anybody coming through the East that they did not know. In fact, during the New Kingdom, we see the construction of numerous forts in what is now the Sinai Peninsula um, and in the Levant in order to protect against Levantines migrating into Egypt without Egyptian knowledge. And we never have such a large congregation of foreigners in Egypt until the conquest by the Persians. Now, that's, that's reason number one. Reason number two is the chariot. Horses are not native to Egypt, and they don't uh, thrive naturally in Egypt. You can create areas where they would thrive by planting grass in the Nile Delta, but um, horses need wide open plains and spaces um, where there's enough grass to feed them. That does not exist in Egypt. You either have the Delta region, which is thick with reeds, or you have a uh, desert, neither of which can sustain horses. However, the Levant can. In the, in the same tone, uh, Egypt does not have a lot of lumber. And to build chariots, you need lumber, which the Levant has, especially in Israel and Lebanon. And um, accordingly, the conquest of these regions led to large-scale Egyptian exportation of lumber and horses from the Levant region into Egypt in order to build chariots and secure control of the Nile Delta as well as the upper regions of the Nile. Uh, this is why during the New Kingdom, we have the expansion of Egypt all the way through to Kush um, and into Canaan. You can see this map in the upper right-hand side of what Egypt looked like in the New Kingdom at its greatest extent. You can also see it extend west into Chenu, uh, Chenu being Libya, right? Um, and their only borders were with uh, the Assyrians, uh, who were coming from the Levant region and the Hittites in the north, which had established themselves during the period of the New Kingdom and didn't exist when the Hyksos were ruling. So there were a number of legacies that they left behind. Um, and we've covered most of them. The first one, of course, is the ritual that Seth was part of. Uh, a, a reinterpreted Seth had become part of Egyptian uh, religion. We also talked about um, their identity, um, that that the Egyptian identity would now be formed in opposition to this invasion and opposition to the Semites. And of course, that sort of spills into the demonism of the Hyksos. Once Ahmose I had conquered all of Egypt and removed the Hyksos, he proceeded to smash all of their monuments to the extent that he could find them, which is why we have no records from the Hyksos of what they thought of themselves and their own conquests or control. We also, as I pointed out, they have these conquests into Nubia in the south and Mercheno, which is uh, their term for the Levant. And in many cases, um, the word Mercheno, when it's found in Egyptian sources, will have marks next to it to indicate that this is an undesired people or undesired region uh, because of the demonism that had attached due to the Hyksos. And finally, I wanted to get to the conflation of the Hyksos with um, with the Israelites. So one of the things is that Josephus wanted to extend the historicity of the Israelite or Jewish people um, to this period um, 
when he was arguing against Apion about the age of the Greeks versus the uh, versus the Jews, and uh, he decided to summon, in his own words, uh, Manato as a witness. Uh, that from the Egyptian side, the Jews were in Egypt, and he refers to Manito's description of the Hyksos. He writes, now this Manito in the second book of his Egyptian history writes concerning us in the following manner. And I've excerpted pieces of it. He quotes it at quite a, quite a, a huge amount of length. And these six were the first rulers among them who were all along making war with the Egyptians and were very desirous gradually to destroy them to the very roots. This whole nation was styled Hyksos, that is shepherd kings. You can see his mistranslation of the term Hyksos because of course he's relying on a Greek understanding of the Egyptian language as opposed to an actual understanding of the Egyptian language, uh, which was Hekachasut, our foreign rulers, right? Um, but according to the ordinary dialect, um, this uh, sorry, that is shepherd kings according to the first syllable hik, which is a king and sos being a shepherd, but according to the ordinary dialect, and this is compounded as hiksos, but some of these people were Arabians. Now in another copy it is stated that this word does not denote kings, but on the contrary denotes captive shepherds. And on this account, the particle hik, for that hik with the aspiration in the Egyptian tongue again denotes shepherds and that expressly also. And this to me seems the more probable opinion and more agreeable to ancient history. Or perhaps it's more agreeable to Josephus's interpretation of uh, conflating the Israelites with the Hyksos. We also see that Josephus quotes another portion where he says, but that Thumosis uh, made an attempt to take the Hyksos by force. Thumosis is not a pharaoh that we are familiar with. It's likely that this is a perversion of the name Ahmose. But the Egyptians came to a composition with them that they should leave Egypt and go without any harm to be done to them. They went away with their whole families and effects, not fewer in number than 240,000, and took their number from Egypt through the wilderness for Syria, but as they were in fear of the Assyrians who had then dominion over Asia, they built a city in that country, which is now called Judea, and that large enough to contain this great number of men and called it Jerusalem. So Manito actually talks about Jerusalem, but we can see from Manito's uh, writing that Josephus cites that he doesn't understand the geopolitics, the geopolitics of the time. Assyria was not the powerful state. Uh, that the Hyksos would have encountered if they moved further east. It would have been, uh, there would have been no state. Uh, and if anything, it would have been Babylon. But um, this moving through the wilderness through Syria, coming to Judea, you can see why Josephus was attracted to this passage. Um, Jerusalem had already existed by this point. It was called the city of Ursalim. Um, and it was controlled by a Canaanite people that the Bible identifies as Jebusites. We don't have a name from their own archaeology that identifies them. Um, uh, but there doesn't seem to, as I pointed out, we have no indication that there were any peoples who moved through the wilderness. And finally, we have one last quote of his, um, and it goes, after those that were sent to work in the quarries had continued in that miserable state for a long while, the king was desired that he would set apart the city of Aris, which was then left desolate of the shepherds for their habitation and protection. But when these men were gotten into it and found the place fit for a revolt, they appointed themselves a ruler out of the priests of Heliopolis, whose name was Osarsit. Then, he then, in the first place, made his law for them, that they should not worship the Egyptian gods and make for themselves ready for a war with King Amenophis. He then passed on with the rest of the Egyptians, being 300,000 of the most warlike against the enemy who met them. For they did not only set the cities and villages on fire, but were not satisfied until they had been guilty of sacrilege and destroyed the images of the gods and used them in roasting these sacred animals that used to be worshipped and forced the priests and prophets to be executioners and murderers of those animals and then ejected them naked out of the country. It was also reported that the priest who ordained the polity and their laws was by birth of Heliopolis, and his name was Osarsif from Osiris, who was the god of Heliopolis. But that when he was gone over to these people, his name was changed and he was called Moses. This is the only mention of Moses in all of Manetto. And um, it seems like Josephus chose this passage primarily because of the name Moses showing up and the fact that there was worship of one God. Archaeologists seem to believe that this was a conflation by Manetto of several different episodes 
probably most connected to Akhenaten, the first Egyptian pharaoh to promote monotheism and the removal of the worship for other Egyptian gods. Now, Josephus actually, after this point, uh, points out uh, that, uh, I don't know if I got this portion, but that uh, the Egyptians who left with this Osarsif were lepers. Um, and so he then takes great pains to describe that, no, the Jewish people aren't lepers. Uh, uh, obviously, this is a misprint by Manetto. He didn't understand what he was talking about, but the rest of it was totally on point. Um, so we have this uh, conflation by Josephus. And until the mid 20th century, the dominant perspective in archaeology in the nascent state that it was, was that Josephus was correct to conflate these two peoples, that the Hyksos and the Israelites were probably the same people because the story of a Semitic people entering, becoming part of Egyptian society, being exiled from Egypt uh, and, and going back to the Levant is the same in both accounts, even though the specifics of those stories are different. There are still people who maintain that there was some sort of Israelite presence in Egypt. The most common theory among those who maintain it uh, aside from those who are taking a direct biblical literalist uh, approach, are people who say that no, the Israelites were similar to the Hyksos and that they were a war band of mercenaries that were brought in during the second intermediate period and were later expelled um, at the end of the second intermediate period. Um, I have a question of whether Josephus is worthwhile uh, considering as a reliable resource. I, uh, Josephus is a reliable resource when it comes to documenting the things that he saw or lived through with his own eyes. So when we talk about the Jewish revolts uh, in Roman occupied Judea, um, those are relatively accurate and are among our better sources for those events. When it comes to his apologia, right, his arguments in defense of certain propositions, like against Apion, um, his views are not archaeologically consistent and are simply trying to use uh, the sources. Um, so in terms of what we know about the Hyksos, um, we use, uh, we believe that Josephus copied uh, Manetto accurately. His interpretations of Manetto are uh, likely to be inaccurate, and Manetto himself is writing about things that he doesn't quite uh, know, because as I said, he is somebody who is centuries removed from the events that he's talking about. So we have to take these accounts with a grain of salt, and that's why going back to the archaeology um, is a much safer road um, when trying to analyze what's happening here. So that is my presentation, and boom, we hit we hit the mark, exactly uh, two hours. Um, and uh, I wanted to say before I open up the floor to questions, if you like the style that I give presentations in, um, if David will allow me, I'd like to put uh, my link in the meetup to some of the other presentations that I do. Um, I have a series on modern Middle Eastern history. Um, and we've already done 26 episodes. Um, we're going to do the Russo-Turkish War at 11 a.m. Wednesday, Australian time, 7 p.m. Uh, Tuesday, uh, Eastern time, which is my time. Um, and uh, uh, if, if, it, if that stuff works for you, then that, then that would be fantastic. Um, uh, so yeah, any questions, comments, curiosities? What method would you like uh, them to use just to uh, jump in or do you want the raise hand? Yeah, yeah. I'll, ra I'll raise your hand if you have a comment and like okay. Phil, um, I'm more than happy to take. Yes, the raise hand you'll find in the, uh, in the reactions icon at the bottom of the screen. So if you, perhaps if you use that, um, we can let people speak in turn rather than you uh, interrupting each other. So please go ahead. And thank you, everybody. I, I've, I've seen your I have to go to sleep messages and your thank you messages. And I appreciate the time that you spent with me. And I'm glad that you uh, that you enjoyed uh, this as much as I have. Yes, Mark uh, Newbrook is, was from the United Kingdom. So it was uh, the wee small hours of the morning for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
My God, we have no um, no com no no questions. Perhaps you can remove the share screen. Uh, okay, for That's starters, fine. and Les Allen has uh, raised his hand. You forced me to raise ask a question because nobody else is asking a question. Um, thanks for a fantastic uh, session, um, Richard. I was wondering what proportion of people who are writing on the Hyksos and, um, well, more particularly, how many, how many of the people who are, who are writing in this area and talk, um, what proportion of biblical literalists who would still maintain that the Hyksos have got something to do with the Israelites and Moses? Pretty much in the main, like if we're talking about the archaeological community um, today, marginal. Uh, we're, 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 uh, we're talking about people who are either trying to fit reality to the Bible or we're talking about people um, who um are reinterpreting the bible to fit the hyksos narrative um but we're not we're not seeing that conf like the majority opinion with regards to the israelite presence in egypt is the one that i showed you with israel finkelstein towards the beginning of this presentation which is that the uh five books of moses and the book of joshua um are not historically accurate in any meaningful sense um, I have a comment here. In 2021, some scientists published a paper saying that Sodom and Jericho were destroyed on the same day as 1615 BC. Would, is that significant? Um, I don't know if it's significant. Um, 1650 would put it um, after the, uh, the fall of the Hyksos, around the time of the fall of the Hyksos. Um, and that could easily be an Egyptian invasion uh, into the territory. I don't know enough about this paper, though, to directly comment on uh, the implications. Uh, Phil? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It was a, a, a very, uh, very important. It opened up part of uh, the Egyptian history. But I am still confused who the Hexos were. So I'm convinced, we. <laughs> I am convinced that there's Semitic people of some sort, possibly the... the, the Israelites, maybe, but but likely maybe not. Maybe some other people from that region. And when you were talking, I was thinking, uh, perhaps the Philistines. Uh, I mean, like, um, but but no, that the, might have been the, later. So I don't know. Yeah, no, no, the the, the, Philist the Philistines we can rule out for sure, and there are a okay. few reasons for this. The first one is that the Philistines were not a Semitic people. Um, they okay. lived in the Levant region, um, in what's now the Gaza Strip and parts of Israel that border the Gaza Strip, like Ashkelon and Ashdod, right? But they are originally from some part of Greece, most likely Crete, but oh. but somewhere from Greece. And they invaded, they, that's why they were called the Sea Peoples. They're, they are one of the descendants of the Sea Peoples. So their language was not a Semitic language. The second is that the invasion uh, happened around 1200 BC. Yeah. Uh, or a little bit after that. So they right. weren't in the region in time to be the Hicksons. Um, okay. So we know that it's not them. And it's likely, uh, like, when I say like, uh, sorry, extremely probable that they are not the Israelites, um, but which Semitic people they are, we don't know. Um, as I said, the Egyptians didn't identify Semites by anything more that they, that they, than that they were Semites. Um, and if somebody from, for example, Mongolia had showed up on their border, they would have yeah. classified them as Amo as well, just like all these other Asiatics, right? They wouldn't have made a distinction. So um, the fact that we know that they're Semites is because of the linguistic analysis that we can do on some of their names um, and some of their uh, some of their burial patterns. I didn't bring this up, but like, for example, um, Hyksos tended to bury horses. This was a very common burial uh, mm -hmm type that we see in the Levant, but we never see this in Egypt. Egyptians didn't bury horses, even in the New Kingdom, because it, it wasn't an animal that they worshipped. Well, thank you for clearing that up, at least. <laughs> yeah. Go um, ahead. I have a comment that says, be aware that Philistines means invaders. Uh, yes. Uh, 
you have to you have to also understand that the Bible was written from the perspective of the Israelites who saw them as invaders. So it it works. Okay, Akiva, your turn. Thank you, David. Thank you, Richard. That was fabulous. I think I know the answer to this question. Uh, in answer to Les's question, you pointed out that the Hyksos are not Israelites and vice versa. The view is widely held in scholarly circles within uh, Jewish religious circles. If you have any exposure to this, is there even any knowledge of the Hyksos as a separate people from the Israelites? And if there is, is there still following Josephus say? a sense of wanting to conflate the two because it increases the history as you or the longevity of the Israelite claim to, you know, um, presence in the Middle East, as you mentioned. I think that's a very interesting question. Within the Orthodox Jewish community, I've not seen any writing about the Hyksos. Um, yep. And I'm relatively familiar with what that community is writing. Um, generally speaking, when it comes to Western style archaeology, Western style science um, and investigation into the past, the Orthodox perspective um, is generally that Orthodox Jewish, sorry, the Orthodox Jewish perspective is typically that these disciplines will eventually come to the truth, right? Uh, there, there is um, Rabbi Moses Ben Maimon, uh, um, uh, who is one of the leading founders of Neoplatonic thought within Judaism, um, and his views are relatively persistent to, to today. And his view was that science will discover. Um, what religion has already found, because both of these are trying to discover the natural world. These are two different sources of knowledge, but they're describing the same entity. So eventually they should come to the right conclusion. Now, Orthodox Jews are of the view um, that science is a self-correcting mechanism, which is something that scientists hold as well. Um, and so to the extent that the religious perspective and the scientific perspective differ, they differ because the scientific perspective has not gone through this corrective process, right? So the answer that science has at the moment is temporary and will eventually be replaced by the biblical answer uh, when enough information is discovered. And they make allusions, for example, to the Big Bang Theory, where there were previous scientific theories that the universe was eternal. And the Big Bang Theory has largely eclipsed those, saying that the universe had a definite beginning, whatever that means. And so the science is now aligning more with the creation uh, story in Genesis, right? So it's this kind of thought process. And so uh, if it happens that, uh, you know, the uh, archaeological consensus is that the Hyksos are actually the Israelites and, it, and it, somehow, then of course, you know that the first Orthodox Jewish person to get a, his hand on this newspaper article will say, finally, science has come to the right conclusion. Yeah. No, thanks, Richard. Just just curious, yeah, the, the Big Bang obviously gets a fair bit of traction because most of the secular world is well aware of that, you know, fairly significant yeah. uh, counter-argument to, uh, you know, the biblical narrative. With respect to the Hyksos and the Israelites, from what you've said, there isn't perhaps enough, you know, knowledge in the general community about, you know, what what is regarded as, you know, kind of the connection between the two and hence from what you're saying neither the Hyksos nor probably Israel Finkelstein although the latter would obviously be known in Israeli circles um, would probably get any mention in orthodox writing because it's easier just to ignore countervailing evidence right yes um, I mean the thing is that the especially when you come to the ultra-orthodox communities um, they really are not looking at information sources um, you have to realize that there is a significant aversion um, to using uh, within the Orthodox community, even uh, if you're talking about modern Orthodox, which is the least religious among the Orthodox, um, there is a strong aversion to using television, and there is a strong aversion to using the internet for anything other than business communication. Um, so in uh, there are, for example, a number of softwares that uh, Orthodox use uh, on their computers that will block pretty much every website uh, from their computer, except for let's say Gmail and a couple others that are needed for business communications. So um, the likelihood that they would encounter this unless they were specifically looking for it is quite low. And so, and, uh, so it's very difficult to assess. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, and you can see in the comments, um, uh, Howard is pointing out that uh, his ultra-Orthodox relatives in Israel didn't even know the word for science. Uh, it, I think it's emoda'a in Hebrew. But um, 
Uh, Les? Uh, yeah, thanks. Just continuing on this conversation about the self-correcting mechanism of science and how it's going to eventually align with what's revealed in the, in the Torah. I'm, I'm thinking those Orthodox Jews who point to the Big Bang as confirmation, uh, as here's an instance of where there's this uh, uh, an alignment between what the Torah says and, and the uh, uh, and modern scientific theory. I'm wondering how do they do that because the Big Bang occurred some you know almost 14 billion years ago, and that's way outside the genealogy given in Genesis. And maybe this is a question for Howard sure, and sure. Akiva um, who've got Jewish backgrounds right. as well. No, 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 no. I uh, know. Um, so, so there are different schools of thought on how to address this. Uh, if you look at the religious Jewish schools, um, they typically argue that the dating only dates from the end of the six days of creation. And the six days of creation can be a metaphorical six days. So it doesn't have to be an exact uh, calendar uh, week of what is it, 140 hours or, or whatever the math works out to for six days. Um, so a number of them have said, okay, so the first 14.599999 billion years were the six days, and then the last 6,000 years was the biblical canon. So th there's that answer. There's also the answer that um, the understanding of science that it's 14.6 billion years old is based on radiocarbon dating. You see this a lot, uh, you see this commonly in more fundamentalist Christian groups that have a young earth uh, view that because of the radioactive carbon dating um, being faulty, right? They'll point to how uh, carbon-14 doesn't work uh, for things older than 50,000 years old. And then they point out, well, the, they're saying it's billions of years old, that, that estimate must be faulty, not realizing, of course, that carbon-14 is not the element that we are using to date the universe. So you've got different ways of dealing with that um, conundrum of 14.6 billion years is slightly longer than 6,000 years. Um, I have a comment, uh, in the, uh, sorry, I have a question in the comments. Um, how did Egypt control its vassal states? Um, it's difficult to tell. Um, we don't have a lot of written, uh, material in terms of how that operated. Um, but we do have letters like the Telemarna letters, which indicate that Egypt was sending correspondence to its vassal states repeatedly, um, and Egyptian soldiers would have moved freely through the vassal states. So it's likely that uh, the vassal states either did what Egypt said for them to do in these letters, or they would receive a visit um, from an army commander that would be slightly less friendly than those vassal states would wish for. Uh, Leon? Oh, uh, thanks, David. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, hello, Richard. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the Middle Kingdom and the Dynasty 12. What is the origin and significance of this name or term, Middle Kingdom? Uh, in the case of China, the term Middle Kingdom is a direct translation of, of the Zhongguo. Chinese name of China, Zhongguo, yeah. The term relates to the geographical location of the origin of the Chinese civilization in the middle region, Zhongyuan, along the Yellow River, Wang mm -hmm. He Liu Yi. Thank you. Right. Yeah, um, basically, uh, uh, the term Middle Kingdom was not used by the people living at the time. They, they would have referred, uh, I'm saying in the case of Egypt, I, I know I know Zhongguo has always been the name of China, but, um, but in terms of Egypt, the terms uh, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and Later Kingdom or New Kingdom, um, these are terms used by Egyptologists to classify these periods of strong Egyptian rule based on how close they are in time to the present, right? Old is older, middle is in the middle, and uh, new is the most recent, right? Um, and so those periods are delimited by the archeologists. It's not something that Egyptians at the time called themselves. Um, Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, we seem to have run out of questions. Oh, it's Howard. Uh, is right. Howard. Okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, the objective evidence doesn't support the, um, well, you'd call it a myth, really. Um, but, I mean, we can argue against it on a moral basis as well. To, to actually, the um, Bible's full of Im immorality, which is then relabeled as morality, um, including the Exodus story. I mean, the, the killing of the firstborn, wiping out every firstborn because allegedly, you know, the, uh, the, the Hebrews were slaves. The chosen one will be born, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that in itself. Um, and then the invasion of, Canaan, <coughs> of the um, Canaanite uh, territories and expelling or killing off those people, uh, enslaving them, uh, raping the women. I mean, it's full of immorality. So you know, quite apart from the, the um, truth of it, uh, it's not something that, well, I mean, we should be arguing against it on the basis of immorality. Yeah. No. Um, the the thing is that the uh, is that the Bible authors, I, I I don't I don't want to impute too much of their mental state because we don't know what it was, and of course uh, under JEPD hypothesis we don't know how many people were actually involved in writing the Bible, um, but they clearly did not have a positive appraisal of Egypt, and um, I I think I think adding to uh, their list of crimes. Uh, baby genocide um, was was a nice way to um, claim that the Israelites were somehow superior. Um, I have a question in the comments of, I'm sorry if this has already been covered, did Egypt control Jerusalem Judea at any point before the Exodus story took form? Well, that depends on when the Exodus story took form, right? Um, if we're talking about the, the collation of the Bible as we know it, the first instance uh, under the JEPD theory that the Bible took any sort of form was during 1000 uh, BCE. And by that time, there definitely was uh, e uh, Egyptian presence in the Levant. If we are assuming that the biblical uh, account of how it was written uh, is accurate, that, there, that during the wandering in the desert, uh, Moses uh, transcribed uh, the text, then what we would see is um, that Egypt did not control the Levant uh, prior to uh, the Israelite presence there. Um, now, if that story is grafted onto the reign of Ramses, then again, we say we would say yes, because during the Middle Kingdom, there were sorties um, to the Levant and vassal states that had uh, been there. Um, yeah, but, uh, but obviously at that time, it would not have been called uh, Jerusalem, it would have been Ursalim, and it would not have been Judea, it would have been uh, Canaan, because those tribes had not yet affiliated. So, if, who would like to make a comment or question? If, if, uh, Richard, oh, you, you said you're going to put some information about future lectures. Yes, I'm going to put it on the meetup page for this meeting. So you'll see a comment there. Um, I'm going to put um, a playlist of uh, my Middle Eastern history series. I'll also put a time, uh, a link to the meetup page for the one that's going to be on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Australian time. Um, uh, so if you want to register for that and see that. Um, and um, yeah, so you, you'd be able to see me if, if if you like the way I present and you like what uh, the the stuff I get to talk about um, this this actually is a topic that is less interesting to me uh, I, I prefer more modern stuff but um, uh, David said uh, would you, would I be interested in talking about this and I said sure I'll put I'll put a you know a few slides together um, so <laughs> Thank you. yeah uh, John. Hello, uh, am I right? Yes, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the C.S. Hammond Atlas of the Bible Lands, and uh, they have uh, mentioned, obviously, the Middle Kingdom, 2000 to 1778 uh, BCE, and then uh, they have the Hyksos invaders that rule Egypt during um, 
uh, through the 15th, 16th and 17th uh, dynasties, as especially Exos dynasties. <laughs> and well, then well, sorry, 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 wait, 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 just one correction. They ruled during the time of the 15th, 16th and 17th dynasties, but they were the 15th. The 16th and 17th were contemporaneous with them. Uh, were, were, did that refer to Hyksos dynasties or uh, there were two, two groups of Hyksos ruling and following a, 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 an Egyptian uh, order of dynasties? The Hyksos were considered 15th dynasty because they are represented on the Turin canon. And so they are they are numbered as a dynasty. But the dynasties, uh, and I sort of talked about this a little earlier, the dynasty, the number of the dynasty just simply start um, refers to when the dynasty started. It doesn't mean that they're sequential. So after the 12th dynasty, the 13th and 14th dynasty started at the same time, roughly speaking. Then the 13th dynasty disappeared and was replaced by the 16th and 17th dynasties together. And then the 14th dynasty was replaced by the 15th dynasty. Right now, I find it interesting that they also note during the 16th dynasty that uh, it's the sojourn into Egypt of the Israelites. Now that's on the assumption that uh, Abraham, Isaac and, and Jacob were historical figures and Jacob then went down to Egypt with his uh, 12 sons. And so they, yeah. in fact, the, the Israelites in, in this picture uh, were in Egypt at the same time uh, as the Hyksos uh, right. while they were, while they were um, active during the uh, 15th, 16th and 17th uh, uh, dynasties. Now, um, obviously there's confusion because you, this would argue the, there was a, a connection between the Hyksos chronologically and the Israelites. Of course, then, of course, they put the conquest and the exodus then later uh, into the, um, the 19th dynasty in 1290, uh, which is much later. But there is this interesting connection between uh, the presence of the Hyksos and the presence of the Israelites in Egypt at the same time. Now, I just wonder how much this is a widespread view amongst uh, you know, academia. Well, if, well, as I pointed out, the academics say that the Israelites were never in Egypt. So, the, it, like, it, it's not it's not something that's really debated. The issue that that your that your Bible is bringing up is that there are 430 years of slavery in Egypt according to the Bible, and so if that is a literal number of 430 years, and of course, as I mentioned, some people may see that as a metaphorical number, right? And it may actually be a significantly shorter time, but this is sort of a round number, and so it's acceptable. But if you go 430 years back from roughly 1300 BC, you end up in roughly 1700 BC, right? Because that, that's the math. And so then you push into the Hyksos period uh, because, the because of the way the numbers work. Um, but uh, it, yeah, uh, I would say from an archeological perspective, nobody takes seriously that the Israelites were in Egypt, uh, except for a small minority. Um, and so, the if i i would agree with you that if the timelines were as your bible claims then the israelites would have been under hyksos rule during the first period of their enslavement um i have a question in the comments does or will dna tell us anything i assume about egyptian control um i don't know how it would tell us anything um dna tells you uh, what your historic origin is, but it wouldn't tell you, for example, how people died. It wouldn't tell you um, uh, what were the circumstances of governance. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything other than a person's ancestry. So I don't know how it would be helpful in determining uh, uh, Egyptian presence uh, in the Levant and, and what that would look like, other than the fact that Egypt's were, Egyptians were there which we know Egyptians wrote about being there. Uh, Howard? Um, there, I read some, um, some stuff about DNA analysis of uh, Jewish people uh, that was able to trace, uh, I think it was the matrilineal line back to four common an ancestors, yeah. which is similar yeah. to the four others. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if that actually took into account or can account for time time lapse 
the four mothers are not from the same generation. The four mothers are actually spread out throughout Jewish history. Um, you just had these sort of you just had these sort of bottlenecks. And the time that these mothers lived can be roughly ascertained, and where and uh, but where they lived, we don't know, right? We can guess based on Jewish historical migration patterns, but those are based on historical accounts as opposed to genetic information solely. Um, and we know about the four mothers, as you point out, because mitochondrial DNA is passed from mother to child uh, in, in, uh, in the womb. So if you track the line of mothers, uh, you will have mitochondrial DNA that you can track. It's the same way that uh, if you track the Y chromosome, you can only get the Y pro chromosome from your father. And so if you follow the Y chromosomes, uh, you will go back to the ancestral fathers. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have these mothers and you can tell when in time they would have occurred because of uh, how far out the similarity is. But yeah, um, that, that's, that's what that is. Would, they, would, they, would any of those four go back to the time we're talking about? No. Uh, these are people within the last 2000 years. Yep. And well, I guess... I mean, the next, the next question would, would have been, uh, is there any way of telling if there's common DNA uh, in people that have been skeletons in, in Egypt? Um, to the extent that there are mummies, I think some of them have DNA, um, but the, uh, uh, I don't know what we would expect to find or discover from Egyptians, right? Like if, if if you're talking about going uh, to the Semit uh, Semitic people and testing them, we would know that they're from the Levant. Um, and we know that Jews are from the Levant as well. So I don't know what we would find that would be terribly conclusive. Um, well, let's say you found skeletons either in, in the desert area sure. or in Egypt for, dating from around that time that had common DNA or something that indicated commonality, which you could actually trace sure. a particular place and time. Um, the, the problem is, is that if you've ever seen um, the scatter plots, for example, of Jewish DNA that's been collected across Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, all these different communities, uh, and you interpose it with, for example, Lebanese DNA collected from the different Lebanese communities and Palestinian DNA collected from different Palestinian communities and Syrian DNA from different Syrian communities and Jordanian in the same way, you see a lot of overlap. Right. And we see overlap because these were all Levantine populations. And these are and you as you get closer to Arabia, of course, you have more Bedouin admixture and that those tend to separate out because the Jews, most of the Lebanese, most of the Jordanians were settled people um, as opposed to these Bedouin populations, which were not settled people. And so there was a lower lower rate of intermarriage. But um, if I get genetic information from one of these Semitic people, it's going to show up in this great scatter plot of uh, Jews, Lebanese, Syrians, Jordanians, Palestinians. And so you would say, yes, they come from the Levant, but you, I, you wouldn't be able to say with any more certainty that they were Jews than they were Lebanese, right? Because the, because not, people sort of expect there to be like a Jewish gene like if you have this gene, you must be a Jew. And if you don't have this gene, you must not be a Jew. And, and therefore I find this person, I know immediately on finding on chromosome 23 on this position, uh, he's a Jew. Um, that's, that's just, that's not how it works. It's, it's similarity across multiple uh, chromosomes and genes. And uh, these show up as scatter plots. And the, the actual fun thing is that when it comes to groups like Jews, right, who are endogamous, uh, they, they tend to marry their own. Um, the genetic plots tend to be very um, concentrated. And even then we have this problem, right? If you go to ethnicities that are exogenous, like Turks, for example, right? The people of Turkey um, are not just the ancestors who migrated from Central Asia. They are the people that they intermarried with, the former Byzantine Romans from all across, the, all across Anatolia. And they intermarried with Armenians and they intermarried with Bulgarians and other Slavic people. And not to mention that um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were mass population exchanges, oftentimes violent from the Balkans and from, uh, and from what's now Southern Russia um, to the Ottoman Empire. And these people intermarried. And so when you look at a scatter plot of quote, Turkish people, 
um, they they show up all over the map, right? And so I, I this is my personal laughing joke, but like you'll have these people who are saying like I I have the true Turkish DNA, and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> like the the concept of Turkey as a modern nation state is a modern concept, and the national concept of Turk comes from Ataturk himself. He invented this concept um, in order to reunite a people that had been divided through numerous frictions. So um, yeah, uh, gen genetics doesn't confirm that you are necessarily X ethnic group. It confirms that you generally come from a specific area. Because this has also got a lot of political relevance to the Muslim oh, absolutely. Israel. Just to, just to explain a bit, well, because of the fact that whether they're secular or religious, uh, modern Israelis want to establish their claim historically to what's now the state of Israel over and, and what's wrong with that because there are well I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it I think it is but no, that's no my, what you that's, what Richard just told you about DNA is not correct sorry what Richard just told us about DNA is not correct what what, what part am I wrong about I don't want to get into a political discussion here please don't I, 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 I really didn't appreciate make a political it if, you if I'm allowed to actually conclude. Well, I'm, I wasn't making a political discussion. The only point um, that, I, that, that I, I, I believe, as I said, that Jews are 11 people. I don't see how that is in any way uh, con conflicting well, with you your made political other comment. You, you made other comments to, to which I responded that I'm laughing out loud because I was trying to be very polite. Okay. Well, if I, I mean, can make a comment at this point, yeah. um, in terms of the Hyksos, uh, I've put up on the meetup pages where our meetup is publicized, uh, a link to the uh, Hyksos Enigma project. Now, that's an international investigation of uh, the, the Hyksos and the Hyksos relics on uh, and it covers not only DNA of humans, DNA of animals, um, the, the agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, being con conducted on, a, on an international basis. And uh, if you just click onto that website, uh, you're sure to have links to all these. Uh, so they have several research areas into all these different aspects and um, a team uh, studying the DNA of humans came out to Australia, to Melbourne, to the uh, Australian Institute of Archaeology, which actually has uh, Hyksos uh, relics. Um, uh, and, and the reason why they have Hyksos relics is, as Richard mentioned, um, early on in biblical archaeology, uh, uh, when it became apparent that the uh, that Hyksos initially, sorry, that archaeology initially was backing up the Bible to the extent that such uh, uh, peoples as the Assyrians and the Philistines and the Hittites, etc., were only known from biblical stories. Uh, suddenly, archaeology was showing that there were such people. Uh, let alone the Egyptians. Um, and um, so um, uh, uh, various Christian groupings uh, donated huge sums of money to the archaeologists. Um, and this uh, applies uh, perhaps more to the English speaking world because the British government didn't back archaeology where the German and the French uh, did. Um, and uh, consequently, um, uh, in Melbourne, uh, someone, uh, Beersley, um, gave money to the archaeologists and uh, who were investigating the Hyksos. And in return, what the archaeologists were doing uh, was repaying their funders in terms of relics. So they originally were, uh, Beersley set up the uh, Ancient Times House. So for those of you who are from Melbourne, it uh, was in Little Burke Street. And eventually that transmogrified into the Australian <laughs> Institute of Archaeology. So they have these institutes. 
uh, these relics and the team came out and investigated them. And I actually asked the director, uh, Dr. Chris Davies, of the Australian Institute of Archaeology, if he would come, uh, you know, be put, re, give the report on what they found, and he said that it's uh, there wasn't much to report except that they were classified as Bedouin. So that matches up with what Richard was uh, saying. They're just Levantine peoples. Mm. Anyway, it's enough from me. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, the, the thing is, is that everybody thinks that genetics is going to be a magical bullet that's going to solve all of their problems. Um, and uh, it, it, it often doesn't. It, um, I, as I said, I've spent a lot more time on sort of the Turkish side. And the funniest thing to me is you have people who are very strongly anti-Armenian for reasons that have a lot to do with modern politics and then they do a dna test and they find out that that you know they have significant armenian ancestry um right or or whatever and, and it's and it's just are you going to change your politics now because you now realize that you are ethnically that no you, you like or maybe you, or maybe you will but like you'll be in self-denial it's just it's just weird because ethnic ethnicity in many senses is more of a social construct than it is a genetic construct. As I said, genes tell you where you're generally from, but people from the same region are often in uh, internecine squabbles. And it can get very interesting within Armenia because they had an, enema, uh, an empire, um, yeah. which the Romans, when the Romans attacked the Levant, that's who they were attacking, the Armenian empire. The, the church usually doesn't mention that but <laughs> I, I mean, they, I mean to... <laughs> yes and the their empire extended to the mediterranean coast and it's where saint paul was born uh well you know a couple of generations after the romans attacked and uh their religion was a hellenized version of zoroastrianism which they held in common with the parthian empire so the zoroastrian religion spread at that stage um from the Mediterranean coast to the Indus Valley. But of course, the, <laughs> the church never bothers mentioning that. But it's, a, it's very interesting. It was the dominant religion of the, of the, the whole area. But of course- Yeah, no, uh, if, you're actually, if you're actually interested, I did in my Middle Eastern history series episodes uh, 22 and 23, I went through Armenian history up to 1650. Um, so I covered that. That was during the empire of Tigranes the Second, the Great. Yes. And that, that he conquered those territories. Yes. Uh, Stephen? Uh, my understanding of history, when you have large invasions, you might have a group at the top that say they are a particular people, they're a tribe. And generally the, the people at the top were called the nobility, the pure ones. But for example, when the Lombards invaded Italy, I think it was only about a, a quarter of them were Lombards by any stretch of the term. The vast majority were Saxons, others were Bulgars and Huns. Anybody that could carry a sword was suddenly a Lombard to invade Italy. The Lombard king said, who wants to join me? Invade Italy. And suddenly they were all called Lombards. Uh, this is just, just typical, yeah, I remember a story about the Vikings attacking some uh, English city and the uh, scholar is at pains to point out the vast majority of the Vikings troops were Irishmen. So the Vikings went to Ireland. Who wants to invade this very expensive, valuable English city? Okay, line up boys, join up. And this would be the case with the Hyksos. They would have been just about anybody who was a uh, well, well, invading Egypt's a good idea. This guy's got, who knows, maybe his chariot forces were Indo-Europeans. They thought, oh, we're not getting a good deal from our own king. We'll go and uh, join with this uh, uh, Canaanite king because he's, he's given us the goods. He'll give us the women and the slaves and all that, and we'll fight for him. Oh, who else wants to invade Egypt with me? Probably all these different 
Bedouin tribes, that's everywhere in history I find that. People have got this strange idea that the invasion force are always pure card-carrying yeah. members of particular tribe. No, I, I, I think that's accurate if we go with the Hyksos being invaders, right? If we go with the Hyksos um, taking power through the Egyptian power structures in the 14th dynasty um, and simply replacing the 14th dynasty by exploding the outer side of the shell, um, then, then you don't even need that, right? Because you already have a lot of Semites from different extractions and, and Egyptians who are already part of a bureaucracy under the 14th dynasty. And then the, they it just becomes the 15th dynasty. So it, it could be either or. Well, if that's the end of... Uh... Those who wish to make comments, um, perhaps we should pack up because it's almost. Um... <laughs> uh, John has a hand raised. Oh, go uh, ahead, this will John. be the last question. It's still it's still early in the West Coast. <laughs> yeah, it's something that's been on my mind. It's the other end of the whole thing. We get the tradition that the Israelites said they come out of Mesopotamia from Ur of the Chaldees and whatnot. Now, if Abraham didn't ever exist. Um, did the Israelites, why did the Israelites have this uh, tradition that they came from Mesopotamia? And the other thing that is happening at the moment is that there's a gentleman called John McHugh, who has been, um, is an absolute expert in Akkadian, and he's written a book, The Celestial Code of Scripture, and he says that uh, every story uh, in, in Genesis that he can find the Akkadians have word plays, uh, celestial word plays in the Akkadian on these uh, traditions like the uh, Garden of Eden and the, um, the flood and, and, uh, and, and these, these early stories. Um, now, I, I'm just wondering uh, where it stands, whether, whether we can say that these Akkadian um, myths, uh, celestial myths that were developed, did in fact influence the, um, the Hebrews. Uh, as being Jews, because the Akkadians are, of course, accepted as being a, Semi a Semitic group that came in about uh, uh, in, in the uh, in the early Mesopotamian period after the uh, after the Sumerians. Sure. Um, the first question is uh, why did the Israelites claim to be Mesopotamian? If that's not true, um, it would it helps them differentiate themselves from their neighbors. Um, a lot of what we see uh, in the early part of the Bible is designed to differentiate the Israelites from their neighbors. There are also scholars who argue, I, I find this argument is a little less believable, um, that in many ways, the early Israelite progenitors, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, were actually an analogs for uh, celestial individuals. Um, and so they could only marry with other celestial individuals, right? The moon spirit and the sun spirit, right? Jacob fights with with God and God and or or an angel or however that fight is construed, because um, the divine being doesn't declare its name, um, but the divine being has to go because the sun has to rise, right? So Jacob is the moon and this being is the sun and this was the daybreak, right? So there's some sort of celestial nature and so these are the children of the gods, um, or uh, or it's simply to say that we're not Canaanite, right? Um, and that's also where the Egypt myth comes in, right? So you have the Mesopotamian myth. We're from Mesopotamia. We're not from the Canaanite subcultures. And also we, we had slavery in Egypt, uh, which none of the Canaanite cultures had either. So we're, we're somehow unique uh, relative to these other surrounding cultures. And you see this in or origin myths from other peoples that they were produced by a god in a certain area or they had some other sort of benefit that the surrounding peoples didn't have, which explains their superiority. If, like if we talk about the Egyptians for a second, the Egyptians had a creation myth that, that proved that they were the superior nation, that Amun-Ra had blessed them uh, over all the other nations and why they had uh, such a strong uh, and powerful Pharaoh, right? That the other countries didn't have. So you have this sort of supremacy uh, situation in most ancient cultures and uh, the patriarchs uh, being from Mesopotamia might have just been uh, the Israelite equivalent of that. Now, your second question was uh, succinctly. Oh, thank, you, thank you for saying maybe. 
Uh, yeah, whether the uh, the Akkadian uh, versions of the celestial uh, constellations and myths had any influence on early uh, uh, Hebrew myths in, in Genesis well, 1 to 11. Okay, yeah, 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 okay. So we know that Akkadian uh, and Ugaritic uh, mythology did have some uh, degree of influence on the Bible. Um, the story of Unlapishtim looks way too similar to the story of Noah uh, for the two of them to be unrelated, right? Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story about Lepishtim, um, this is part of the epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh discovers that there is one person who has been granted immortality, and this and that is this man with Lepishtim. Um, it was in the days when Enlil was angry with the world and decided to flood the entire world uh, when Lepishtim was warned, um, and he uh, built a boat for him to survive this flood. Uh, when the flood waters receded, uh, he walked out of the boat. And he was granted immortality so that Enlil could say that no living person had survived the flood, right? Because now he was an immortal, he was no longer alive. And so he, so he got himself out of it. But, uh, and so Gilgamesh, of course, leaves uh, very saddened by the fact that Udnapishtim's circumstance of acquiring immortality was not replicable. Um, so... We need, we need to remember that many of those stories were written in Mesopotamia during the first exile. Right. So we will have a lot of origins that um, are Mesopotamians. That's not, not because of some kind of uh, celestial myth. It's just, this is where they, they were. Yeah, I, that, that's, that could also be. Um, in terms of when when we have the earliest versions of the Bible versus the earliest versions of these other texts, these other texts tend to predate the Bible. So um, the general idea would be that they came first, but of course we only know the text that we found. All right. Um, yeah, so you. I guess yeah, uh, it's it's about one a.m. where I am, so I think I should <laughs> I should get some sleep. Um, it's well, thank been a pleasure you. Thank talking you, to all of you. What? I'm just saying it was terrific presentation. Go on. I interrupted you. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say thank you, everybody, for, you know, taking your time with me. And uh, as I said, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if, you, if you've been here for three hours, clearly, <laughs> clearly. You had might, nothing if, you, <laughs> if you Hebrew is good, there are very good lectures by Mordechai Kedar. They're on yeah. YouTube about the Middle East, the origins of different ethnicities. Uh, I think you might want to listen to it. You might find mm -hmm. it beneficial. I, I I find it much funnier when he's on Arabic television speaking in Arabic because he does do that. Um, and um, yeah, I mean the because because then it becomes very polemical. But uh, anyway, so as I said, I will put links to my stuff in the meetup page for this. Um, and when I upload this uh, to YouTube, I will give you a link to that as well uh, on the same meetup page. So um, good night, everybody. And thank you all. Thank for you. Thank you, Richard. Good night. Thanks, David. Good night. Yes, and thank you all for participating. And just remember that we intend having these monthly lecture discussions on the, on the history of religion. So uh, we'll, we'll continue on in a month's time. Um, uh, and um, just uh, we've and go through the centuries. <laughs> so thanks again, Richard. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank David, you, everybody. Good night or good day or whatever, wherever you happen to be. Richard, by the way, is from New York. That's why it's one a.m. over there. We're we're here at yeah. Central, yeah, which he is five p.m. in Melbourne. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say he you can hear the accent, right? Accent, yeah. I mean, I could have pretended to have an Australian accent and start talking a little bit more like this, but um, <laughs> I thought it would be a little insensitive. Um. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, cheerio, everybody. All right. See you. See you All at right, the next at the next session. All right. See you. I guess.